uh, Samuel will just be like, where was his Oscar? And I'm like, well, he won for French Connection, the first one. And he'd go, well, that's ridiculous. They should have saved it for the second one. Well, yeah. Sammy really knows a lot about the history of the Oscars. No, just Gene Hackman. Oh, okay. He knows a lot about Gene Hackman. My son's favorite movie is Welcome to Mooseport. <laughs> <laughs> and he, but he also loves Extreme Measures. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, that was the one with Hugh Grant, right? Where the doctors were experimenting on homeless men? I thought mm. Extreme Measures was the one where Andy Garcia needs to get Michael yes, Keaton's bone marrow right. for his I mean, son. Oh, maybe that's a different one. Which Since one am Michael I talking Keaton, about? Michael Keaton, the serial killer, is the only match for his son. <laughs> then am I th- what's, what's maximum risk? Maximum uh, risk? I think that has something to do with uh, Wesley Snipes jumping out of a plane. Okay, what about Total Overhaul? Is that a movie? <laughs> <laughs> what about, I think, I think that's a... That's a, a a house show? Yeah, what about Gut, Gut <laughs> Reno? HGTV. Is that an action movie? <laughs> Gut Reno? <laughs> That's John Reno's bigger brother. <laughs> it's John Reno opens a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically Ratatouille, but instead of a rat, it's Jean Reno. Uh-huh. And so people are like, a Jean Reno in the kitchen? Never. Oh, uh-huh. blah. In the hill department. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, so is it? does it have cars in it? Yes, show it to Sammy. Uh-huh. Have I seen it before? If the answer is yes and I like it, show it to Sammy. If the answer is no, who knows what? No, I don't, I don't a, think so. You're right. It is extreme measures. I don't know what the – Oh, Okay. I don't know what the Michael Keaton one is. Like, Desperate... Desperate Times. Des- yeah. De- <laughs> it's called Call For. <laughs> desperate Measures, maybe? Maybe it's called... Uh, it's not Nick of Time, because that's with Johnny Depp. Mm-hmm. It's not... Let's go down the list of movies it isn't. <laughs> it's not Tender Mercies. That's with Robert Duvall. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. It's not... Uh, Yuli's Gold. It's not Yuli's Gold. That's with Peter Fonda. Yep. <laughs> it's not Baby's Day Out. It's that's not, with a baby. It's not Angels in the Outfield. No. It's not Angels in the Outfield or Angels in America. Two very similar films. <laughs> Films. <laughs> yeah. It's not Fat City. That's with Stacy Keach. Uh, Dan, should I keep naming movies and yeah. the people who are in them? Uh, sure. It's not Thelma and Louise because that's Susan Sarandon. It's mm-hmm. not The Hunger because that's also Susan Sarandon. It's not Dead Man Walking because that's Susan Sarandon. <laughs> it's not Earth uh, Rocky Art Picture Show. That's Susan Sarandon. It's not Earth Girls Are Easy. That's Gina Davis who's also in Thelma and Louise with Susan Sarandon. Desperate Measures. Desperate Measures. Uh, I got it. So Stuart got it. <laughs> yeah. So that was a lot of time wasted. Sherlock Gnomes, shall we? So I'm not familiar with Nomeo and Juliet. Well, I assume it's a very uh, faithful retelling since Nomeo and Juliet are still alive <laughs> for Sherlock Gnomes. Spoiler alert for anyone who isn't, hasn't seen Romeo and Juliet. They mm-hmm. don't make it out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, Dan, you're a big Sherlock Holmes fan. This is true. Tell us a little bit about your love for The Great Detective. Uh, I think it comes from my childhood desire to be smarter than everyone. Mm-hmm. And I think that, I mean, like, that's... I which, think that's uh, you, which you gave up on eventually. Yeah. I see. <laughs> and this is clear. <laughs> <laughs> now I now my, now I, I just decided to be best at, the best at fumbling words. Wow. Something, well, uh, an attainable uh, goal. A joke you also kind of fumbled a little. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's how good, he's that good, man. Oh, man. He's the best. You nailed it. Uh, so, Sherlock Holmes, tell us a little bit about this character. For anyone who's not familiar with maybe the most famous character in detective fiction. Well, he, he lives at 221B Baker Street. This seems like not the best detail to introduce him. <laughs> he's the one oh, he lives somewhere? Uh, like, tell, me about these, tell me about these X-Men characters. Well, they live on Gray Malkin Lane. <laughs> he's the world, all right, he's the world's greatest detective. Okay. That's a good start. That helps He's, me get a picture of him better. Uh, along with uh, Auguste Dupont, the Poe uh, uh, character, he kind of introduced the idea of deductive reasoning to the mystery uh, genre. Mm-hmm. And before uh, then, it had mostly been what seances or like and, people uh, making there wasn't really well, like a mystery. Encyclopedia Brown, so I think, much. Was first, right? Yeah, 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 that's right. Encyclopedia Brown and then Wikipedia Brown, who just makes shit up. His best friend and partner is John H. Watson, who uh, what's the H stand for? I don't think they ever established that. So let's I just think, call I think, him John Watson. I think that might have been one of those th- things that, um, like Conan Doyle, like says one thing one time and says another thing uh, another time. I, I, but maybe not. Like how he has a uh, an injury that migrates from his leg to his arm, depending on w- what story we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Sherlock Holmes is a woman in some of the stories, right? <laughs> um, Doesn't he die and regenerate into new forms? There's yeah. like the first Holmes, the second Holmes, uh, the third Holmes. I think you're thinking of popular character, the Doctor from Doctor Who. Doctor mm. Who? <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Sound of a high five. 
Stuart nailed it. I mean, I could go on about Sherlock Holmes for quite okay, some time. So, so maybe the, don't. The movie so, begins and the Reichenbach falls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, kind of, in a way. Uh, now, Dan, but Sherlock Holmes, so you were getting into this pretty excited because you love Sherlock Holmes. That's right. You were like, I can't wait to see what how he works <laughs> in this world. It translates to the gnome. And, and he, this Metier. is a character that hasn't been captured in TV or film in decades. Yeah, yeah. He's, um, I don't think he's ever been used. I don't think he's ever been a television or film and by also, Sherlock Holmes. And also, Dan looked at the, uh, the, 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 the voice credits for this movie, and he saw his favorite actor, Johnny Depp, was yeah, going to be right. doing the voice. Mm-hmm. That's thing, right. You, you said, uh, I mean, I might be paraphrasing here, but you were saying it's not that you like him as an actor so uh-huh. much as you just like his personal life. You that's think right. Really <laughs> I think he really knows how to handle situations. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I was like, oh, you would never do anything abusive to anyone. <laughs> yeah, I remember oh, no. you, you referred to him as an empathetic for the past few years. <laughs> as an empathetic and stabilizing influence, mm-hmm. I think is what you referred to him as. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, probably as like completely realistic perceptions of how money works. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And doesn't not, like wine. <laughs> is not a Hollywood vampire, I think you mentioned. <laughs> uh so Nomeo so let's make one thing clear. Nomeo and Juliet, these are not like magic gnomes. They are <coughs> <laughs> They're ceramic garden gnomes uh-huh. who come to life Toy Story wise because this posits a hideous oh, fantasy world where all garden decorations actually come to life and pretend to not be alive when humans are around. So if you ever had sex in a garden, you were being watched by like a ceramic bird well, or something. That's, <laughs> I feel like that's the, the least likely thing to be concerned about. But I hate to derail the podcast already, but. What's alive in this world, guys? Uh, I think so, everything. Uh, alive like is the story Toys of or? the of a soccer team. Yeah, is that, that in that this crashes world? in the Andes? Yeah, yeah. I think that's. I think we have to assume that the the story, the real life story, and the book and film alive took place in the uh-huh. Nomeo and Juliet world. What about the song Alive by Seattle's own Pearl Jam? <laughs> you you got to know it. Yeah, is that the one that about how they're they're still alive. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. So in this world, what's alive is I think. Human beings, okay. regular animals, although I don't... Yeah, we see a squirrel and a dog, uh-huh. and also anything you would place to decorate a garden, okay. and yeah. also toys, and also uh, Chinese tchotchke, like salt shakers and luck cats, so everything's alive, I guess, in this. Everything okay. except furniture and they have, buildings. like, a weird name Well, anything that could be anthropomorphized, I think, is alive. Yeah, I guess, you know what? If it has a face, it's alive, uh-huh. so... And, but that makes me wonder then, if you arrange two eggs and a peach strip of bacon into a face <laughs> on your plate, oh, does dear. it come to life and then scream you're... when you eat it? Yeah. Is it like, well, I ex- it's like the whale in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I exist all of a sudden. What is this world? No! No! Yeah. Yeah. But isn't that all of us, really? True. I mean, that is, I find that to be, that scene with the whale in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I think is maybe uh, touches me more than any, emotionally, <laughs> more than any other thing. Because it's literally this character being like, what what is this? This is wonderful. There's so many great things. I can't wait to experience life. And then it's dead. And I'm like, well, yep, that's everybody. Yeah. That's everybody's experience. Mm-hmm. So see you, see you next time on the Flop House. That's right. So why don't you why don't you sit down and spend some more of your precious time with us? <laughs> yeah, this uplifting world. Uh, so we bummed everyone out. We talked about sex swings. Sherlock gnomes. That's right. Okay, yeah. So in this world, every, I think that's a good it's a good uh, way to put it, Dan. Everything that can be anthropomorphized that has like features uh-huh. is alive and can talk. Uh-huh. Now. We begin. We begin. We begin with a stupid prologue where the gnomes argue about what story they're going to tell. We're going to skip that. It's uh-huh. just an occasion for dumb puns like Spider-Man gnome coming mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Uh-huh. And it's yeah, like the rise and fall of the gnome and empire. Whatever. Yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah like, it, fucking yeah, gnome country for old men is sitting right there, <laughs> <laughs> sitting right on the table. <laughs> Yeah, so let's – then they don't say that. Uh, so Sherlock Gnomes, he's just what he sounds like. He's a garden gnome of Sherlock Holmes, and he's fighting his enemy Moriarty, who is not what he sounds like. He is the mascot of a pie company. It's like if a Bob's Big Boy but yeah. for pies was evil. And I never quite understood the logic behind this character. They're just trying to make it – I think they just want to look like a goofy big baby who's crazy yeah. and has a rolling pin. Because yeah. rolling pins in England, of course, as we've seen in the Andy Cap comic strips, are weapons of domestic violence. And that's why you need a license to own a rolling pin. Yeah. <laughs> Very hard to get a gun, so a rolling pin is really what takes the place of guns in England. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Moriarty wants to smash every garden gnome in London, and Sherlock Gnomes is devoted to saving the lives Which of is, every Which is, in this in world, mass murder is, is his goal, basically. Yeah, he's a bad guy. Yeah, it's not but, like he's held up yeah. as an example. Yeah, you don't have to... <laughs> but Moriarty in, like, the books is not, like... I'm a serial killer. He just, you know, wants to do crimes. Well, yeah. This is a crime. Yeah. He's the Napoleon of crime. Yeah. Now, if he's the Napoleon of crime, does that make Sherlock Holmes the Wellington of crime? 
I mean, you know, he kind of is. He's shitty to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mean the Stuart Wellington. <laughs> oh, yeah. Then I don't know who's which one are we talking about? Uh, boots, <laughs> <laughs> Wellington boot wellies. Uh, so they have a big fight on a dinosaur skeleton in the otherwise empty British Museum. They have this British Natural History Museum that. Let me just take a moment to d- complain about this. Every room in this museum has one enormous skeleton in it, no other exhibits. And yeah. it must have been easier to animate because this is a CGI movie. But it's just huge empty halls with one skeleton, no information plaques. So are we supposed to just walk into this museum and kind of ponder or deduct things ourselves? <laughs> I think the way they've 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 moved over to a digital age. So you, you're supposed to like listen to um, the audio to But there's like a QR code that you just uh-huh. like scan, you scan on your phone. Your phone that's yeah. like beep, the, remember when those were really <laughs> big <laughs> and everyone was using QR codes? <laughs> there, he, there's a uh, there's a statue in uh, the town of Sonoma, California, which is a little town known for its wine. There's a statue of the first governor of the town when it was still Mexican uh, this was still uh, in Mexican territory, uh, Governor Vallejo, or Mayor Vallejo. Maybe Boris it's just Vallejo? Mayor. Boris Vallejo, the painter. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, and Julie Bell is right there. Oh, There's my. a statue the of him. Statue, <laughs> the Boris Vallejo statue that's just a muscle-bound man with women clinging to his legs. Yeah. Uh, that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's more of a, um, that's more of a, oh, what's his name? Who's the other big? Uh, Simon Bisley. No, not Simon Frank, Bisley. Frank Frazetta. Frank Frazetta. Oh, okay. The women cling to legs is more of a Frank Frazetta thing. Okay. With Boris Vallejo, it's more of a like, oh, okay, he really sculpted the ass of this barbarian. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's it's really, a really he really paid a lot of attention to the glutes on, on this barbarian hero. I mean, he, he can't shame him for understanding the physio- the anatomy of a human being. No, look, I'm not going to, I'm not complaining. Anyway, uh, but there's uh, this statue that they just put up recently of Vallejo sitting on a bench. And he has a book in his hand, and there's a sculpted QR code just kind of slapped onto this, uh-huh. the book he's holding, and it looks very silly. Uh-huh. And But it's, you could easily miss it, but there, I feel like in 10 years, someone will be like, what is that on this statue? Yeah. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. It's like if you did a statue of, they may put up a statue of George Washington in the 70s, and they were like, let's just have him holding an 8-track tape. <laughs> like, we'll just have it popping out of his pocket. There'll be like... There'll be a movie in like 30 years or something where somebody's doing like a national treasure t- type mystery and it'll be like, and see this? They're like, what the fuck's that? Like, that's a thing called a QR code they used to use. It stands for crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, this museum, it doesn't work right. But anyway, uh, Sherlock Gnomes manages to stop Moriarty. The uh-huh. dinosaur skeleton collapses on top of Moriarty. Everyone assumes he's dead. And Watson gives this kind of like mysterious look like, hmm. And it was at that moment that I knew Watson was going to turn on Sherlock Holmes. No, that was exactly the same here. I don't know. Is it three for three here? Yeah, was three so like three, five yeah. minutes in, you're like, okay, so Watson's going to be a bad guy in this. <laughs> uh, we cut to the present day, I assume. I don't know how long ago that was supposed to have taken place. The older co- An older couple is moving to London. I assume they're in the first movie yeah. because they bring their garden gnomes with them. And that includes Gnomeo and Juliet. And mm-hmm. all the gnomes hate the London backyard they're now in. I guess they used to be in a big garden. Probably. Now they're in a, like a little, what in a city was a beautiful backyard yeah. space, but in a, like a suburb or in the country would be a little like shitty postage stamp. You know? Yeah, it, it kind of makes me long for uh, seeing the sweeping vistas of the uh, Nomeo and Juliet garden. Uh, you maybe really? We should, maybe we should pop that in. Now, if you were <laughs> moving from a like beautiful like like countryside uh-huh. to one of these places with like a tiny garden, would you bring your garden decorations? Like, would you put garden decorations in like a tiny city garden? I mean, there's there is plenty of room for them, and there the reason I assume that they're moving is that they can no longer handle the upkeep of a large country home on that kind of piece of land. They're getting older, Dan. Or maybe they're, and maybe they're, they're, they have children and their children have just had a young child and they want to be close to that young child. Yeah, yeah. And so... This is all important backstory. You reach you reach a point in your... The first half of your life, Dan, is the accumulation of things. Uh-huh. You're expanding. Your life expands and with it, your kind of footprint in the world expands. And there, you reach a point in your life where that footprint begins to contract. Mm-hmm. And That's when, the, when you, the whale, are getting closer to the ground. Exactly, yes. yeah. And you start to divest yourself of things, whether by choice or by not. And I remember uh, see, visiting my grandmother uh, in a like hospital for old people, and she was like basically sleeping in a hospital bed, and she just had like three things. She used to have this big house full of stuff yeah. from her travels around the world and she just had these three statues from Africa that she had brought on a shelf and like one book and I was like oh like that's what happens when you get to certain ages you to, to get ready for divesting yourself of your mortal shell 
you begin to divest, divest yourself of physical objects. Well, I mean, and so also, thank you for bringing the podcast back down. All I, <laughs> all I was going to say was that it seems like the more likely sequel to Nomeo and Juliet would be them in a, in a secondhand store where they've been sold off. Well, let me explain. So they bring these. They're like, these are our children. Okay. These are our, uh, these are our spiritual children. We have to bring them with them. And now their real kids are going to be like, we got to talk to mom and dad about the garden oh, gnomes. Wow. We got to. To, we got to get rid of these garden gnomes. Excellent they can't work. take care of them anymore. Hooba dooba doo. Bingo. Hit it. I got blisters on my fingers. Uh, that's from Helter Skelter. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. They, so we, among these gnomes are Gnomeo and Juliet. They are, I'm just going to say it. Are they an annoying couple to you guys? What do you, well, do you mean because Gnomeo is voiced by, like, the chaviest uh, <laughs> James McAvoy? Like, James McAvoy, known for being kind of like a cool posh dude, is like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna slum it up with this He's, accent. I'm east endering it up with I'm this one. I'm calling everyone mate. Yeah. And, uh, it, well, it just, I think more because they, like, kind of, like, joke with each other and, like, rub noses and stuff. There's a part where they hold, love, e- they hold each other's hands and spin around and stars fly out. And this goes on for, like, 70 <laughs> minutes. I remember yeah, watching yeah. it and being like, You're are like, they still spinning around? They're like, is this goddamn Elton John song on repeat? What's going on? <laughs> That's the other thing. So... I didn't. I this was a mystery to me until Dan cleared it up for me. Is that this movie is obsessed with Elton John? Almost yeah. every song on the soundtrack is an Elton John song, even when it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Even the orchestral score includes pieces of Elton John songs. Yeah. Uh-huh. So Dan, what's that all about? It's co-produced by Elton John's. Uh, like it's called Rocket Pictures or Rocket Films or something like that. And Rocket Man Films. Exactly. Because that's an Elton John song. Exactly. And he, it's like specifically for family <laughs> movies. <laughs> but wait, those aren't true. <laughs> <laughs> what? Rocket Man is an Elton John song? Yeah, it is. Yeah. No, Crocodile Rock is. Rocket Man is David Bowie. No. No, that's You're Space Star Oddity. Man. So, or, sta- or Space Wait, Oddity. What's Rocket Man? Rocket I'm a Man. Because I'm a Rocket Man. Oh, I'm sinking into my chair. <laughs> Electric Socket Man. <laughs> Anyway. You got a Grocket man. Don't, it's a Heinlein reference. <laughs> don't fight with us, the two big Elton John heads in the room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're a bunch of Johnos. Yeah, <laughs> we're big Elt butts. <laughs> I'm, I'm taking a time out. We're from All the right. uh, we're from the uh, benevolent protector order of Elts. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so Elton John is a producer of the film, is what you're saying? Yes. Or his company is? Yes. Because there's there's a part where you see an Elton John gnome for a moment. Yeah, in and one you're scene. like, why? And like, why? Like, <laughs> and I, con- contemporary reference. <laughs> yeah, and I wasn't sure if it was like one of these things where like uh, Lonely Island is with um, what's his name? Who's that singer? That nobody likes. I have no Michael idea. Bolton. Oh, Michael, Michael Bolton. Bolton yeah. Where you just choose like kind of an older musician. Guys, I'm, out of, I'm out of the penalty box. Yeah, I'm yeah. You, ma- you remember Michael Bolton? <laughs> okay. Uh, what I liked is there are two David Bowie songs you might have gotten Rocket Man mixed up with. <laughs> there was, I was I was thinking about recently if you were going to name the top ten most influential science fiction writers of the 20th century, I think you'd have to put David Bowie on that list. Like I don't. It's hard for me to think of a big influential music like. Of, of any sort of art, who was that in science fictiony? Yeah, in his in his work, like it, and in a way that I feel like his fans didn't look at necessarily. Hmm. But you look at David Bowie's stuff, and there's so much stuff about aliens or like altered perceptions or things like that. How time can change me, but I can't trace time. He was going to yeah. do like an adaptation of 1984 in like music form which turned into the diamond dogs album which i learned that this is david bowie or this is bowie whatever that exhibit do a little exhibit. ad for the brooklyn museum <laughs> yeah. exhibit which the i think is almost closed, closed great now. great museum though still worth going to yeah yeah they've come got, on support the arts they got some good stuff they've got uh and if you go to the brooklyn museum go to the visible storage section it's pretty cool Oh, okay. And That's then, a little uh, tip from Elliot. Need a little tip go from one who blocks knows. away and throw rocks at Dan's window. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Smash them. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, we can talk about David Bowie later or not. I'm not that big a fan of his. I just like that he's a science fiction oh, guy. Oh, wow. Now that he's, now now that that he's he dead. Now that, now that the boaster, now that he and I are no longer friends because he's dead, mm-hmm. I can finally say what I think, which is that he's fine. Oh, wow. Jeez. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, I just remember when he passed and everyone was like, there's no God anymore. The stars have fallen out of heaven. And I was like, yeah, he's really good. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it's like, that's the way I'll feel when like John Cleese passes. Uh-huh, but I then guess. when Vinnie Paul from Pantera dies, I was like, it's no! like, oh! <laughs> ripping his How shirt will off I ever butt. walk again? <laughs> <laughs> Daniel's like, Sammy, you need to leave daddy alone for a while. I'm like, Sammy, a cowboy went back to hell today. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, Juliet's parents, I guess, are like the king and queen of the gnomes. They name Gnomeo and Juliet the new leaders. The winter's coming. Uh, and I guess the and so that means beyond the wall, the uh, the yeah. ice people are attacking or something, <laughs> some kind of snow zombies. Uh, and meanwhile, there's another gnome they're friends with who has a crush on a statue of a frog. Ben, Benny, voiced by what? Matt Lucas. Now this frog, by the way, is supposed to be an analog to the nurse from Romeo and Juliet, uh, which I only uh, which I only found and out. Is Benny supposed to be like Mercutio? Because uh, he's nothing like him. He's I, not like Tybalt either. I, I, I can't remember. No. I went to the Wikipedia page for <laughs> Nomeo and Juliet, and all of these characters that don't I seem like, like anything are supposed to be analogs for maybe characters. Maybe Fiery uh, Tybalt was killed in uh, Nomeo and Juliet. Maybe. Somebody had to have been. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so Okay, so you're saying in Nomeo and Juliet, these characters were created for Nomeo and Juliet, and yes. now they're just kind of like stuck in this new movie where exactly. they don't really fit. Okay, because yeah. I was like... I don't care about this other gnome and his crush on this frog. And the frog is voiced by, what's that actress's name that's great? Uh, From no Extras idea. and Catastrophe? Yeah. Oh, what is her name? Dan, you're the one who looked at the Wikipedia page. Uh, yeah, but well, I don't retain great. everything. I'm not Sherlock Holmes. I don't retain everything. Uh, maybe I see you should. In my I'm gonna look it up real palace. Although, I gotta say, uh, a lot of this movie. Oh, people, Ashley Jensen. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, she is great. Uh, a lot of times people would show up and I'd hear a voice and I'm like, is that fucking James Corden? <laughs> yeah, I did that over and over. I guys. thought that Moriarty was was James Corden. I thought, that, and I, I was, thought that I was, Nomeo was James Corden, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> especially when he's when he's did his uh, gnome pool carry gnome key. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. James Corden not in this film, but it is the kind of. But he was in the Emoji movie. Which we That's, watched. I don't know. We haven't released that episode yet, have we, Dan? No, we haven't released. Okay, it. so get ready. We will. We'll talk about James Corden in that one. Uh-huh. True Believers, Face Front, Excelsior, <laughs> as seen in that episode. Uh, that's a story for another time. Like the giant rat of Sumatra, Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Gnomes. So, Sherlock misses having an enemy now that Moriarty is dead, and he clearly doesn't respect Watson. He just doesn't give him yeah. any respect. Which He's, turns. I gotta say that Sherlock. I can't believe you just stepped on his uh, his Rodney Dangerfield bit over here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, nope, it's Ro- too late now. Or Rover Doggerfield. I can't tell which one it was. Rover Doggerfield. <laughs> I think it's just Rover Dangerfield. <laughs> now, that's crazy. Our new character, Rover Dogger Pup. As you can tell, he's a Ro- he's a Rodney Dangerfield parody. Why would I be able to tell that? His name has been mangled into incomprehensibility. <laughs> His name is Rover Dogger Fido. Is that a hearty fire scene character? What is? I don't understand. Uh, what I was going to say, though, sorry about interrupting, was that, like... Don't be, Dan. Sherlock Holmes. Turn about his fair play. Sherlock Holmes, the original character, is uh, an, sort of an arrogant cold man, but he's still likable, in part because of his devotion and friendship with Dr. Watson. Now, how do you feel about... I feel like this Sherlock Holmes is less a take on the stories and more a take on the Benedict Cumberbatch Sherlock Holmes. Could be. Could be. Uh, how do you feel about this understanding of Sherlock Holmes? Much the way that every Marvel hero, like Doctor Strange, is now Iron Man, a a wise-ass who is a real fuck-up, but he's a hero in the end. Even the characters that shouldn't be like that, like Doctor Strange... Why, how do you feel about every Sherlock Holmes now being like kind of a sociopath who is mean to other people? Yeah, or like uh, Johnny Lee Miller, who's basically old Sheldon, like an old version of young <laughs> Sheldon, all grown up. Well, that's the second part of my thought is that like, I'm glad this, I teed it up. You're welcome. This uh, <laughs> this Sherlock Gnomes is so much less likable than Sherlock Holmes because he's such an asshole to his gnome, uh, Doctor Watson. Yeah, like, Doctor Watson gnome. There's no. I just feel like you're watching this thing and you're like, why am I supposed to care about this guy? Like, what, this gnome? Why am I supposed to care about this gnome? This gnome is an asshole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that when you watch a movie and you find yourself asking the question, why am I supposed to care about this gnome? I feel like the movie has failed. (laughs) In that moment, or gnomant, as you might say. Yeah. And you just want to go and listen to the work of Klaus Nomi, or in the gnome world, Klaus Nomi. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, Sherlock is not respecting Watson. Gnomes are disappearing again. Uh-oh, just like when Moriarty was around. And there's a TV news story about it where they mention Sherlock Gnomes. And so I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> is the TV news I... making a joke, or is Sherlock Gnomes famous? I was kind of into it. 
because I kind of was into this bit because it was like they it, they seemed like they were kind of a, it was a, a moment of self aware like winking at the audience. Okay. Yeah, and then, for me. like they ended the seg- the TV segment by being like, "Why are we reporting on this? This is not a story." Well, then they go like, "Some say it's a mist a catastrophe. Others, it's a slow news day." <laughs> yeah. So there are there are a few jokes in this movie that are funny jokes. Yeah. I got, this was a funnier movie than I thought it would be. Still not. I wasn't laughing a lot. But there were funny things. Okay, so back to the gnomes. We're introduced to the horror that is Mankini Gnome, who yeah. is a gnome wearing a Mankini with like a foreign accent. So it's like, is this a takeoff on Borat? I think it's a Borat thing. Yeah. It's the same. The same. Mankini. Or just and just the general uh, joke that like Europeans are uh, often wear small swimsuits. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and they're ju- just so advanced. I yeah, that's think. what we'll all be wearing in the future. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll just change out of our silver jumpsuits that cover our entire body. And underneath <laughs> that silver jumpsuit is a slingshot swimsuit. Yeah, with a yeah, slingshot thong slim swimsuit. Slim mm-hmm. suit. Because uh-huh. they're very slimming. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. Uh, Juliet is so focused on making the garden work that she's not paying attention to Nomeo. Nomeo's all like, Wah, what about our relationship? Wah, wah, I'm a baby man. And it's like... And we're supposed to sympathize with Nomeo here, but there was part of me that was like, you guys have a big job to do. Like, yeah. finish the job. Don't wor- Juliet is still your love. Like, she can be interested in work and not be interested in you. Anyway, Nomeo, there's only one solution. Go on a spy mission to steal a flower for her from a florist shop. He almost gets caught, though. Uh-huh. And, uh, Did Ju- this tie into the main plot at all? I can't remember. No, it's what you would call a side quest. It just okay. got, the, it got, it got the two of them out of the out of the garden so that when the rest of them all get scooped oh, up. Yeah. Right. And also it gives them an op- Juliet an opportunity to get mad at Nomeo for endangering himself. So they have an argument. When they get back, all the other gnomes are gone. Mm-hmm. It removes them from there. Sherlock and Moriarty show up because Sherlock has deduced that... that Sherlock and... Watson. Oh, sorry, Sherlock oh, and Watson. Wow. Uh, oh. Audience left. oh, boy. Sherlock, uh, he thinks Moriarty's back. He's deduced that that garden will be hit next. All the gnomes are gone. So now, uh, Sherlock and Watson... And, and there's no- a Moriarty calling card there, right? Yes, there is, yeah. which is a, literally a card with an M on the back and a mm-hmm. clue on the front. Now, to deduce the clue, Sherlock does the first of a few times when he goes into his, like memory palace in his yeah. brain in 2D animation and I gotta admit I loved these sequences I like this yeah, 2D animation pretty cool yeah. and it was like what, they did a great job with them they're super inventive and I was like oh right cause 2D animation is amazing cause yeah. you can do anything with it and it does like it made me realize that moment I was like I would like this movie a lot more if it was not a CGI movie. Yeah, it's true. The CGI, the, I didn't haven't thought about it before, but the CGI cartoons are sort of tethered to reality in a way that 2D stuff isn't. Very much so. With CGI, it, the choice seems to have made at a certain point that the purpose of CGI animation is to get as close to reality as possible. And by doing that, you lose a lot of what I'm going to call the plasticity of animation. Yeah. Like forms can no longer bend and change because they have to seem real. And I think part of that's because... When you're drawing, you can do whatever the fuck you want. You're just drawing a picture. But with a computer, you need to work out the physics and the mechanics of it so that it doesn't look weird and messed up mm-hmm. when it's when it animates. <laughs> a, uh, a task that the makers of Food Fight uh, failed at. <laughs> yeah, but in a weird way, I'm like, it makes me look back at Food Fight and go like, oh, at least like the characters in that were looked like weird cartoon characters. They were hideously ugly yeah. and awful, but... But the but like when it it just reminded me like oh it, like two D animation if you look at like the old Warner Brothers cartoons or like old Disney stuff like there's <clears> all no the limit. Non, all the non racist stuff the stuff that's not I'm not saying go watch Isle of Pingo Pongo or anything like we, that uh, a buddy of mine did, hosted a uh, like a uh, breakfast cereal and animation thing where he did a curated like three to six hour block of Whoa. animation that was animation through decades. Oh, cool. And it started, uh, and man, I, I've seen that, I've seen that presentation in various forms a couple times mm-hmm. and that bit with, uh, what is, what's uh, Mark Anthony, the dog and the tiny little Oh cat. yeah, Feed the Kitty. I could watch that fucking cartoon every day. That's a great cartoon. And it's not just because of the fetishizing of the housewife with the, uh, <laughs> yeah. with, who wears high heels while baking stuff. I've, I've seen that cartoon with like a crowd like three or four times and it always works like gangbusters on everyone and like everyone's like on the verge of tears at various it's points so like in addition he, to laughing. Yeah, when Mark Anthony thinks that the kitty got made into cookies yeah. you're like, no! <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a sweet cartoon. And but, you're also like, Disney cartoon, like, this kind of cartoon, uh, it's Warner Brothers? Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers yeah. yeah. That was like, like Chuck Jones That's cartoon, back in the day when, like, they could chop this kitty up, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, there's a hint of danger. Well, there's, you could, it's, the Warner Brothers would never go quite that far, 
like what the story I ever heard, always heard about Tex Avery was he left Warner Brothers because there was an early Bugs Bunny cartoon he did where Bugs Bunny is being chased by this dog and they fall off a cliff and they're going ah and you you believe that they died and then they go fooled ya and then it abruptly cuts to black and what that what was originally happens in that cartoon is they then step off a cliff for real and die for real <laughs> and it ends with their tombstones <laughs> and we're both like we're not really going to kill these characters and Tex Avery left and then he went to MGM where they would allow him to kill the characters mm-hmm. there's a Screwy Squirrel cartoon that ends with Screwy Squirrel having been murdered by, <laughs> by a dog yeah. and Screwy Squirrel has X's on his eyes and he holds up a sign that says sad isn't it <laughs> but, but like uh, so I guess what I'm saying is CGI feels like it has hit a cul-de-sac in yeah. a weird way and seeing these 2D sequences where Pe- there's peaked at reboot right is what you said <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I said reboot was the crest and everything after it's much like when a peaked dire, long, long peaked the dire straits video <laughs> <laughs> it peaked with Weird Al's Beverly Hillbillies parody of the dire straits video uh, <laughs> the, it was like a, uh, it was at it, least there's I, no like problematic verses in the Weird Al you give a I hope not yeah uh, he avoids any slurs in it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. except for Hillbilly. I mean, uh, you could argue uh, that it's a parody, but still, you know. But uh, there's that there's in these two D animation scenes. There's just like it, there's like an inventiveness there that there's all these tiny little Sherlock's running around and like there's yeah a, a, you've, the dimensions of the screen are, are moving around a lot and it's yeah. anyway it just is really cool. So nice whoever did those sequences, nice. Yeah, work. there was the mo- moment where I'm like. I'm going to have to say something that I genuinely like about this movie. <laughs> Never thought I'd say this, but here's the part I liked about Sherlock Gnomes. Anyway, we'll speed through. Uh, Sherlock and Watson race off to the next where the next clue takes them. Nomeo and Juliet follow along. There's a tidal wave action scene in a sewer pipe set to a guitar version of I'm Still Standing. And this is when I started realizing there's a lot of Elton John in this movie. Uh, the, uh, Watson says they have 24 hours to follow Moriarty's clues before he smashes all the gnomes. The first clue leads them to a trinket shop in Chinatown. Uh, where there's a tiny salt shaker voiced by James Hong. And yeah. uh, there's a lot of, like, luck cats everywhere that they and have to I, run away from. I was slightly uncomfortable with the design of the salt shaker, the Asian salt shaker. Yeah, but it was, I wasn't I'm, quite I'm sure how racist it was. You. Yeah, ja- I mean, but James Hong is great. Oh, oh sure. James Hong's fantastic. Everything. I love, love James Hong since like, I was a kid. And, like, his comic timing's great in it. Like, oh, yeah. But it, it, there, I was like, in my notes, I go, it's all somewhat racist. Or is it? Like, I couldn't, <laughs> it made me uncomfortable. But there, he, Sherlock, he did something back in that place that they didn't like, so they chased him out. Uh, Nomeo argues with Sherlock, and Juliet takes Sherlock's side. Uh Uh-oh. So Nomeo runs off with Watson to the Natural History Museum, and Sherlock tells Juliet, you're probably going to break up. That it's a 98%... He goes, it's a 99% chance you and Nomeo are going to break up. She goes, what? He goes, well, I rounded down a little bit. But then they see a dragon. Uh Uh Uh-oh. It's a gargoyle that attacks Nomeo and Watson. So gargoyles are alive in this universe? Yes. And do they... Are they protectors like they are in the cartoon? Not like the cartoon at all. They are big, dumb... Uh, low class yeah. uh, bad guys, and apparently okay. they can fly around even though they're made of cement. That, okay, Dan. Right, now you, bring, you raise a good point. <laughs> How do they get up in the air <laughs> since they're made out of cement? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't understand Bernoulli's principle enough to explain how this works. And I would have guessed that was the case. Yeah. <laughs> no offense, Dan. If you said to me, well, here's how Bernoulli's principle works, I think my eyes would have popped out of my head. Yeah. Likely like you're wearing glasses or else I mean, I'm to just hit the <laughs> yeah, I've table. Just I right have back. a basic understanding about it. It's something about how the air has to ride, move faster on top of the wing than below it, which creates lift. But uh... Pardon me while my eyes pop out of my head right now. <laughs> uh, so it, it raises the question. A gargoyle is like literally a block of stone that's been chiseled. Yeah. But so do they have, they can expand their wings and move around. Do they have like skeletons and understructures? I mean, it's the same thing is where it, it magic? seems like some of the garden gnomes, like the smaller, more minion-y type garden gnomes, don't, can't seem to move their arms or legs or anything and just kind of bounce around. Yeah, and then there's the one gnome who's like attached to the uh, who's toilet. Who's sitting on a toilet all the time, but then he gets up from the toilet later on. Uh-huh. Does he? He jumps up to dance, and it's like, but then later he makes Watson carry him on the toilet and it's like dude we saw you get up off of that toilet <laughs> just get off and carry your own toilet the, so like it's it's questionable i don't think we can do any hard or fast rules about what can or can't work right. in this universe okay so the gargoyles attack nomeo and watson this is after watson has dropped another clue that he's a bad guy he goes we all have our good and bad sides sherlock Look, me looks at the camera <laughs> he looks at the camera holds up a sign that says i'm a bad guy and and Chuatel Jayapur does the voice like, I'm going to be as ominous as possible. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to channel my children of men voice. Uh, oh, what a good movie. So 
Watson in the in the conflict plummets from a roof and we hear a shattering. Uh oh, Watson is dead, and Nomeo gets kidnapped. And Juliet is horrified that Sherlock isn't sadder that his friend Watson died. Mm-hmm. I'm horrified too. As a Sherlockian. Well, but there is a sta- Sherlock. Is that does what you, of- call- I thought it was Lockheed. Uh, I thought yes. they were John Holmes's. <laughs> it was the Sherlock Holmes fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have any other ones. You guys are gazing at me as if I'm going to contribute. Uh, this, they call themselves Slylock Foxes. All right. Mm-hmm. So, Dan, good. are you more of a Sherlock Holmes fan or a Slylock Fox fan? I'm a Max Mouse fan, personally. <laughs> wow, really? <laughs> I think you just wanted to say that name. Dan, yeah. have you ever gone to London and like tried to find 221B Baker Street? I've been to 221B Baker Street, yeah. They've got uh-huh. a museum there. Of what? Fake stuff? Sure, yeah, sure. So they, yeah. They've recreated Sherlock Holmes' fake apartment. You know, there's like, you know, tobacco in his Persian slipper and uh, Victoria Regina uh, initials. Excuse me. <laughs> the wall with bullets. <laughs> uh, everything. From the. Do you think when Queen Victoria was around, when people would say Victoria Regina, they would then go, because <laughs> it sounds so much like vagina? Mm-hmm. Probably. I mean, I don't know. It was the Victorian period. They, they were they were repressed, but they you know they had their little stuff going on underneath the surface. <laughs> That's true. That's true. They were pretty kinko, uh, much like that that sex shop kinkos. <laughs> I was so, it was so surprising to me how you like you go to the small towns and then right there in the strip mall there's like this sex store called yeah. Kinko's uh-huh. that's huge. They're enormous, and people are just walking in and out. Like, they it's no big deal. You have sex like, with the uh, Xerox machines. And yeah. you're like, can I get a pair of sex swings? They're like, only comes in once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, can I buy two ones? <laughs> no. <laughs> the second one is, is twice the price for some reason. <laughs> it's actually, buy one, get the second one much more expensive. Uh, okay, so... Nomeo's ki- uh, Nomeo get kidnapped. Uh, Juliet and Sherlock, the only thing they can do now is wander through a modern art museum where Sherlock goes to find inspiration. Mm-hmm. And Nomeo- and Juliet realizes she realizes she misses Nomeo. Even though they had one fight, she still misses the love of her life yeah. when he's been kidnapped by a dragon monster. Uh-huh. Uh, Nomeo finds he's been taken by the gargoyles to a big gnome dance party. All the gnomes are there and they're having a great time. But he's pretty sure it's a trap, and they're all going to get smashed. more Elton John music. Yeah, there's lots of Elton John music. I think it's Philadelphia Freedom is what they're dancing to, like uh, a club version. And Mankini Gnome is dancing his heart out. He loves it. It's his favorite thing. I see a lot of gnome butt. Yeah, yeah this movie, so... And there's a, there, there's a fair amount of, like, gnome homophobia. For, like, gnomophobia. Gnomophobia. <laughs> that's you beat me to it, Dan. <laughs> that's directed toward Mankini, like, the you idea... You think so? I feel like I've... I don't know. I got that impression that, like, Explain. the other male gnomes were put off by his uh, exhibitionism. Huh. I hmm. thought that they were very accepting of Yeah, I thought they were all into it. Okay. Uh, the, maybe, the, I mean, the fact that his... Maybe I brought something different with me. <laughs> That's on me, I guess. I mean, Robin Wood would say that you bring yourself to the film no matter what. No or I matter guess, what. No matter what. Or I guess maybe it's it's not him, but in a, in the essay, The Immediate Experience, it talks about how... Uh-huh. Uh, the reviewer has to admit that he is a human being uh-huh. who has gut reactions to things. Uh-huh. And so you can't, there's nothing you can watch objectively. You always bring your frame of reference to it. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's what's going on here. As we all know, Stuart, I saw a you're bit very... of myself in Mankini. <laughs> I think that's it. Because as we all know, Stuart is very uncomfortable with his own body, other men's bodies. <laughs> so I think One I... thing we know about Stuart. Because <laughs> uh, they, uh, they seem pretty okay with Mankini's butt just being out but then when Toilet Gnome stands up for a moment to dance everyone is horrified by his butt he hasn't wiped that's oh why. that's what it is oh I wait you're so you're, you're telling supposed- me that there is <laughs> n- ceramic poop stuck to his butt I assume so <laughs> like what gnome artisan is so so perfectionist that he's like you know what I'm paint- I'm cr- crafting a gnome sitting on a toilet no one's gonna ever know that this gnome has a little splotch of brown paint on his butt, yeah. but I'm gonna know. I'm gonna know, yeah. I'm gonna know. And mm-hmm. so I have to make sure, this is like when uh, so, like someone hides a little something in a, in a work of art, so that, uh, that only they're gonna know about. But here's what I was gonna say. I first encountered this film as a trailer before the film Ferdinand, which I took my son to go see because we were... Is there a car in it? Uh, there are cars in it. Okay. Uh, we were trapped in New York. Hold in, on to. I'm alone too, trapped in New York. <laughs> uh, because there's a mysterious dome around the city, and yeah. Kevin McAllister can't get out, yeah. and the city falls into chaos. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, we were trapped in New York. Our flight home had been canceled. It was the coldest winter in New York in 100 years. And we ha- we were like, let's go to the movies. We went to see Ferdinand. The trailer for Sherlock Gnomes was almost all butt jokes. Mankini's butt, toilet gnome butt, a part where Sherlock Gnomes is shaking his butt in front of Juliet. And I was like, ugh, 
come on. And watching this movie, it's like, oh, every butt joke in the movie is in the trailer. Yeah. Like, they know what kids like. Kids find butts hilarious. Yeah. As my son. And adults, too. And adults. My son's favorite phrase now is booty butt. Okay. Which he says all the time. Uh, I do not care for get it. Get him a t-shirt. <laughs> it just says booty butt on it. Uh, but anyway, so. They're at this if you take the phrase and put it in a t-shirt, he will grow out of it just like the phrase will. G- <laughs> Wait. <laughs> I'm trying to turn that into some kind of some kind of curse. <laughs> uh, okay, interesting. Yeah, trying to weave a spell around this. Uh, how to get your kid to stop. To stop saying booty butt. Yeah. I mean, it's better than the other thing he says a lot, which is about how he's going to cut my hands off and (laughs) and cut my head off and stuff like that. Wow. That's just but that's just four year old boy stuff. Uh, All right. I used to. I mean, as soon as he starts torching animals, just let me know. I told Danielle. I said if he's not wetting his bed, lighting fires, or torturing animals, we're doing okay. If he starts doing two of those three things, we're in trouble. When I was a little kid, uh, the 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 invective I would throw at my mother whenever I was angry is that I was going to crush her bones and throw them out the window. (laughs) (laughs) I think I've mentioned that. That's pretty good. So, uh, so it's probably a trap, this dance party. The gargoyles seem pretty sinister. And so, uh, Sherlock... And oh, so Sherlock and Juliet, their next clue takes them to a park where Sherlock was once bitten by a dog and they're in a squirrel costume. Yeah, it's and, like the Hound of the Baskervilles reference is thrown in there. Yeah. Uh-huh. And they get chased. There's a chase scene with a riding mower. And Sherlock. They're chased by a spectral hound across the moors. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It turns out that it's not a really a ghost. Mm hmm. And then Alan de Botton writes a whole book about how Sherlock Holmes picked the wrong guy in the story, oh, really? taking advantage of. Have you ever, never, have you ever no. read Sherlock Holmes was wrong? No. It's a book about basically he's like taking advantage of plot holes in the in the story oh, to explain no. that it was actually a different person who was a murderer and Sherlock fell for the, it's the like real the, bad it's guys. It's like the story. original Honest Trailers or something. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, yeah. In a way, it, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Uh, and so, uh, but we're learning that these clues are sending Sherlock to places where he has had embarrassing things in the past that he has to face. He oh. is not liked at the Chinese trinket shop. He was bitten by this dog. And he has the to next, go visit a former love. He could go to a doll museum or store or something mm-hmm. where his former love, Irene, named after Irene Adler, right? Yeah, voiced by Mary J. Blige. And yeah. also, like, the person who uh, opens the door for uh, at Irene Adler's place is uh, Gregson, which is the name of the other big dete- uh, Sh- uh, Scotland Yard detective other than Lestrade. Oh, oh I didn't no. know that. Oh. Yeah. Is there a Lestrade in the movie? No, there wasn't. It was, I, it was yeah. interesting that they went with Gregson. Just, I thought they were like, we're going to be subtle for once in this movie. Mm. We're, gonna, we're not going to take the road most traveled. We're going to take the road slightly less traveled. Yeah. Uh, they also take the road very less traveled in that when going to see his ex fiance Irene, who is a doll, she does not explain anything about the plot but instead has an entire R&B song about how she doesn't need him and she's super strong now that uh-huh. has no bearing on the plot and this it was one of these weird things where it's like if this movie was a musical you wouldn't have to have an explanation for this scene I just take it in stride but this movie is not a musical this uh-huh. is the only scene where the characters break into song so it seemed very out of place it was like if the music man was a drama and then suddenly uh, Buddy Hackett starts singing Shapoopy. And you're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> well, I don't understand why this is happening. But in the but because the music man is a musical, when Buddy Hackett starts singing Shapoopy, you just go, well, every musical's got one crap song and this yeah. is it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, this was this is my cue to ride that ten second skip button. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, Irene sits down with Juliet, and Juliet, while speaking, realizes that Nomeo is devoted to her, and that he just wanted to get her attention so badly because he loves her. Oh, that's sweet. Nomeo, meanwhile, he escapes the gargoyles and their dance party by having his friends set up a play uh-huh. for the gargoyle who loves fairies to wa- and princesses to watch uh-huh. so he can escape. And it's during that play that the frog realizes that Benny the gnome has a crush on her okay. because he can't kiss her in the play because he likes her too much in real life. Mm-hmm. Now, Dan, you're an actor. Yeah. Did this run? Did he run in this situation a bunch of times where you're like, right. I don't want to kiss my co-star because I'm secretly in love with you? Uh, I don't think I would have that problem. I mean, that sounds gross. Dan, call up your call what, up your friend. What gross about? Call up your know, friend. Like, Kid now it sounds like now it sounds like I'm taking advantage of the fact that I'm in like the play to like. No, but that's exactly why you can't. Why you're having trouble? Kissing exactly. Her. Yeah, I mean, I you feel want like it to be for real. That's the plot of so many uh, bad comedies, right? Is that the like teenage boy starts taking drama as an excuse to kiss the, yeah. the co-star? Yep. 
I mean, let's write so, one right now. <laughs> it's what? Let's write one right now. Okay, okay. so interior, the school gymnasium <laughs> it's day. Called, it's called uh, the Boner Police. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a gritty also, drama. <laughs> <laughs> that's also the name of the uh, that's the the name of the hit song that comes off of the movie yeah. from like uh, like I don't know. Uh, Go on. Name, wall name of sound or something yeah. like that. Come up with a contemporary music. I don't have any. A uh, Vampire Weekend? Uh, yeah. uh, sort of. Uh, TV on the radio? Is that a thing? That's uh, yeah. Uh, Boner Police is the song by Migos <laughs> that comes out of the movie. Hey, awesome. Uh, anyway, uh, and of course, Cardi B has, has a oh, verse right. on it. Yeah, she's got a verse. I mean, cool. she's engaged to the guy from Migos. That's. Can you name that person's name? Of Ellie? course not. <laughs> Jimmy Migos? Bobby Migos? I don't know. <laughs> Felicity Huffman? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she just disappears in her role. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Who's to know she hasn't been member Migos all this time? <laughs> yeah, she yeah. can play a man transitioning into a woman. I don't understand. It reminds me of, uh, what was it, William H. Muffman? Was that the... <laughs> Felicity yeah. Huffman, William H. Macy, <laughs> Colbert. Yeah. Colbert. William H. Colbert, William H. Uh So uh, Nomeo leaves, but the gnomes are still in trouble. And Mankini gnome saves the day by having a by getting the the gargoyle to dance. So then finally, Watson reveals to Sherlock and Juliet he's been behind all this because Sherlock hasn't been respecting him, and he's never treated him like an equal. Or he used to treat him like an equal, and now he doesn't. And he only thinks about Moriarty all the time. So Watson set all this up, but the gnomes are really fine. They're not in trouble. Let's go over to the dance party I set up for them. They'll be okay. Uh Uh-oh. That's when the gargoyles turn on Watson. They weren't really working for Watson. Who were they working for, Dan? Moriarty, who is always not dead. He's never dead. Except, I mean, in the Sherlock show, he's dead. So they introduced that crazy story about Sherlock's sister, who's who's crazy and lives Uh, on an island prison. That Don't was even so talk to me nuts. About that. I mean, like, and she's pretending I, to be a little girl on an airplane. I kind of liked I, it just because it went so crazy. Like, it I was, was like, this has gone off the rails. But I can imagine if you watched the first episode of Sherlock and then the last episode of Sherlock, you'd be like, what the hell happened? <laughs> yeah. Like, what happened in between? It's like uh, the, Stephen Moffat just literally went insane. It's between. the biggest jump between Road Warrior and Road Warrior Two. <laughs> we were like, okay, in between movies, a nuclear war ended human civilization. Yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. that was an interesting thing to gap. I guess the juice is precious at this point. <laughs> uh, I actually you said Road Warrior, <clears throat> Road Warrior Two. Come on, Mad Max and Road Warrior. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, sorry, Mad Max, Mad Max Two is what I meant. Yeah, because Mad mean, Max Two is the Australian title for Warrior. Yeah, I apologize. Okay. Mia culpa. I'll commit seppuku look, after okay, this look, recording. Let's go into the penalty correct box. Correct me enough that I have to take my licks where I can get them. No, you're right, and I'm sure the listeners were doing the same thing. They were like, that, "It's I Mad was, Max, I not Road Warrior." Yeah, they're sharpening many their tweets. knives. Thank you. I, I am still going to get a tweet that says, "Hey, did anyone tell you that it's actually Mad Max?" Mad Max, and I'll be like, "Yeah, Dan, in the episode." <laughs> my favorite thing is when I'll get something wrong, and someone's with me. I'm sure a hundred people have already correct you about this, and I'm like, "Nope, nobody except you." <laughs> <laughs> it turns out nobody cares about this thing that's so precious to you. You have to correct it. Welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> I remember writing into there was a website where they refer it was I think it was on like Think Progress or something and in, in a blog post they referred to Ernest Lubitsch and I wrote in being like probably a lot of people wrote mentioned this too but it's Ernst Lubitsch not Ernest Lubitsch and the author of the post wrote me back and was like oh no thank you I appreciate that no one else mentioned it mm. I'm like oh yeah I guess no one else gives a shit <laughs> Whether Ernst Lubitsch's name is correct. Well, the, the, was that before or after Ernest Lubitsch went to jail? Uh, it was after he went to camp before he saved Christmas. <laughs> sure. Uh, so uh, Moriarty's like, I'm still, I'm still alive. I faked my death, and he has them kidnapped. Uh, Gnome Juliet and Sherlock Gnomes and Watson taken to a boat. They go, when this boat hits Tower Bridge, the drawbridge is going to go up, and that drawbridge is going to crush all the gnomes. So you'll be the, he's like, you'll be the unwitting cause of their death. And I wanted Sherlock Gnomes to be like, in no way am I causing their death right now. I've been kidnapped and tied up on a boat. I cannot control this boat. It would be doing this whether I was here or not. You did this. Don't put this, don't put this ceramic blood dust on my hand. But anyway, he doesn't say that. Uh... Uh, let's just cut to the Guys, chase. In a when they make the inevitable like gritty Ernest reboot, okay, the post credit scene is going to have a moment where Ernest is like, "Know what I mean, Vern?" And then you're going to like you meet you'll Vern. hear, and then Vern will like step out from behind, and Vern will like, be like a, the, uh, like a screen, a yeah. Japanese screen, and he'll be like the Rock or something. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be awesome. Yeah, <laughs> no, Vern is going to, or Vern will be like David Hasselhoff or some other ironic casting or something mm-hmm. like that. 
the gritty reboot of Ernest. <laughs> like, what would yeah. that be like exactly? Oh, it's it's gonna be rough. It's called like Ernest avenges a rape. Like, <laughs> <laughs> wow. So it's like the crow Whoa. or something wow. like that. Whoa. It doesn't get I grittier. Spit on your Ernest. <laughs> Ernest spits on your grave. Yeah. 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 So what other what, what how other gritty way is it gonna? <laughs> I don't work? know. Look, I went as gritty as I could possibly <laughs> get. Ernest goes to the last house on the left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I'm sorry, guys. I got a little too real for you. Okay. So our cut to the chase. Our heroes all work together. Sherlock fights Moriarty <laughs> while Watson saves the gnomes, and Watson proves he can come up with solutions to things. I feel like you can just tack on Ernest at the beginning of most movie titles, and it works. Like. Hey, Ernest, don't look in the basement. Hey, Ernest, (laughs) children shouldn't play with dead things. (laughs) Hey, Ernest, Sophie's Choice. (laughs) Ernest's List. Oh, no. Uh, Imagine if Ernest had been the one saving all those youths from the Holocaust. It never would have worked. I feel like that's the kind of pressure that would bring out the best in Ernest. (laughs) I mean, he always proves himself in the end. That is the kind of crucible that creates diamonds. Even when Ernest was literally scared stupid, he he managed to stop those goblins and save Halloween. (laughs) With milk. It was milk, right? That did the trick? Yeah. Goblins hate milk, apparently. Yeah. Hey, look. Most adults don't like milk either. I so. don't. I, I, I don't handle it very well. <laughs> There's a reason that uh, when Sean Penn was starring as Harvey Milk in the movie Milk, a lot of people were like, "I don't know about this," and I was like, "No, no, it's not the drink. It's a person." And they went, "Oh, okay, never mind." Oh, that's then. why Josh Brolin's so mad. <laughs> he likes the drink. <laughs> he loves drinking milk, and he's really mad he can't drink Harvey. Yeah. Okay, anyway. I can see Dan getting uncomfortable as I t- as I touch all these hot button issues. No, no, no. I was just so close to the end. Oh yeah. Anyway, then G- Nomi and Juliet defeat the gargoyles. The end. And Sherlock risks his life to save Watson from Moriarty. Uh-huh. And Watson saves Sherlock at the last minute. And Sherlock apologizes to him. And you know what? They're best friends again. Yeah. And uh, Benny and that frog finally <laughs> kiss each other. Uh-huh. And then there's a jump forward to spring it's the spring day celebration Nomeo and Juliet are in charge they did a great job and of course they throw a dance party and Sherlock and Watson are there and they walk off arm in arm Sherlock now limping with a cane as Watson used to use a cane because he hurt his leg fighting Moriarty because I guess no garden gnomes have bones that can break there's a part where Moriarty stomps on Sherlock gnomes his leg and he goes ah and it's like wait hold on a second and it's implied that he hurt like broke his leg yeah. it's like so what did he wait hold on what's inside him because they're hollow right yeah <laughs> what's inside him <laughs> like, is it chocolate or gold <laughs> like what yeah. but uh and uh I have to admit it was a little touching to me to see them walking off into the distance two old pals uh-huh. Friendship back together again, arm in arm. Mm-hmm. And Sherlock now depending on Watson in a way that he hadn't before, both physically and emotionally. And thus ends Sherlock Gnomes. Did you guys stick around for the bloops? The Were there bloops? bloops? I fast forward no, I fast forward through the credits. I think I there was fast no stuff. Through the credits. Yeah, there was I fast forward through to see who the voice cast was because I like couldn't recognize so much of it. Uh-huh. And I wasn't sure which of how many of the parts yeah, James you Gordon played. To, you didn't want to just say James Gordon all. <laughs> I want to be one of those things where there's just all the names and there's a bracket and it just points to James Corden's name. Uh, So let's do our final judgments, whether this is a good, bad movie, a bad, bad movie, or a movie we kind of liked. You know, I won't say that this was a movie I liked, and I'm not sure it's a bad, bad movie either. And it's not a good, bad movie. It's not a good, bad movie. It's not like a movie where you laugh at. It's a movie where I just, my reaction was, why does this exist? <laughs> it's a baffling movie. Other than the rhyme, like there's no like the rhyme is the entire reason for this movie to have been made, and like the fact that it still uses the Nomeo and Juliet characters and it's a crossover, like is this the sort of movie? John song, like all of it, none of it, like the pieces fit together. It's, it's like even someone Sher- tore up several scripts and just threw them up in the air. Even Sherlock Gnomes himself would would be hard pressed <laughs> to solve this riddle. Yeah. Uh, Elliot, you have a kid. Uh, is this the sort of thing that you would put in front of your kid, like sit your kid down and be like, this will keep him entertained for an hour and a half? Here's the thing. So I agree with Dan. It's not quite a bad, bad movie. I didn't quite like it, but it was better than I thought it would be. And so when I saw the trailer, I was like, my son has never seen this movie. It's nothing but butt jokes. It looks stupid. But actually watching the movie, I was like, I'd be fine with him watching this. I don't know yeah. that it would necessarily keep his attention. It feels like it's so much about whether Nomeo and Juliet are going to stay together and Sherlock Gnomes is like deduction, I don't know that a kid would be that interested in those things. And a lot of the jokes are like 
There's a lot of jokes where Moriarty, like, can't get his computer to work right. And he's like, how do I share screen? Hold on. Wait, let me do And, like, it's not a joke that I think a kid would necessarily find funny. But, and all that, like, gnome wordplay, like, I don't know. But if my, if Sammy was like, I want to watch Sherlock Gnomes, I'd be like, all right, okay, that's fine. You can watch it. I don't need to watch it with. Well, I mean, what I would do is what I do a lot of times when he's watching TV, which is he says, Daddy, watch this with me. And he'll watch a show, and I'll just fall asleep next to him on the couch. Mm -hmm. And then he'll wake me up and he go, Daddy, it's over. And I'm like, oh, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of like when I watched uh, Deadpool with my wife. <laughs> And you fell asleep and she kept nudging you to wake up? Yep. She's like, you're missing all the exciting action moments. He's talking to the screen. <laughs> so, Stuart, what do you think? Would you show your son this movie? Yeah, I mean, guys. Your son is a cat, by I, the way. You might want to hold on to your wigs so they don't flip off. But I think this might be a movie that wasn't made for us. <laughs> <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Wait a second. I don't Three know. approaching middle-aged men. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Uh, I mean... It's probably more made for us than for a lot of folks, but I don't think it's made for us. So, like, it's hard for me to... It's definitely a kid's movie. Uh, it isn't... It doesn't feel too offensive. No, there are a couple times where characters do the thing I hate where, like, something will fall on from the time and they'll go, oh, fertilizer. Like, where the joke oh, is that they're yeah. not... They're kind of swearing, yeah. and I hate that. But there aren't, like... Do you remember when every kid's movie seemed to have a Scarface reference in it? Like every kid's movie had Are a part. You thinking of MTV's Cribs, where every crib had like a Scarface room? <laughs> That's what I think of. No, there was a period where it felt like every kid's movie had a moment where someone would say, "Say hello to my little friend," and they'd bring out like a little tiny guy or something yeah. like that. And I would be like, "Stop it! This is a reference to him. This is not a ref if a kid gets this reference, the parents have done a and bad job." And also, like, it, that's a reference that. I'm almost too young for. Like. <laughs> yeah, like I mainly yeah. get it because of seeing it as a reference so many times. Yeah, it's not like Scarface is so planted in my mind, but like uh, that this movie doesn't have much of that. Like I feel like there, were, aside from the like almost swearing jokes and the baffling amount of Elton John references, there's not. There's it does feel like it was made for like Elton John grandkids or something or grandnephews. <laughs> I mean, I kind of wouldn't be surprised if Elton John's kids were like his grandkids were like. We don't have anything. We don't have anything to watch, Grandpa Elton. <laughs> and he's like, produce a movie. <laughs> oh yeah. Like we're bold, Grandpa Elton. Well, I'll just put a movie into production. So in a year and a half, you'll have something to watch. Yay! Yay! Until then, we'll just sit here and drink our tea and eat our plum jam. <laughs> don't go into that wardrobe. Oh, but they have Turkish delights in that wardrobe. <laughs> Whatever that is. <laughs> I remember, do you guys remember as a kid, do you have this experience of reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and all those mention of Turkish Delight and being like, what is this, this magical no, this candy? Be the best yeah. candy ever. <laughs> this has got to be the most amazing candy in the world. Well, once I understood that sweet meat was not meat, yeah. that it was that it was ever on sweet, I was like, what is this candy? This kid is selling out his reality for it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Have you had it? It's terrible. No, I've never had or like, it. Or like, like a sweet breads, you're like... I don't think that's bread. <laughs> it's not very sweet, and it's like, not bread. Of like a gooey cube that is like usually like rose water flavored, and sometimes it has like mm, pistachios and walls. Sounds terrible. <laughs> I mean, Do you also I have mean, the I'm experience where you're like, wait, what the fuck's Santa Claus doing here? That was uh, my experience of lying in the witch in the wardrobe. Oh, I don't think it. I mean, I'm as a Jewish kid, I was always asking that question, yeah, yeah. so it didn't bother me that much. <laughs> The news today is terrible, so why not forget about it while listening to Joan Radio uh, with Cash Hartzell. Hey, everybody. Featuring Neil Mahoney. Also me. This is a podcast where we play music submitted by a uh, listener. We hang out, we listen to new tunes, and uh, we take submissions at Jonah Radio, R-A-Y-D-I-O, at gmail.com. Come and check us out. We're here anyway. Yeah, we'll yeah. be here. So, and that's it. Back to your regularly scheduled uh, podcast. Yeah, Mark. Hey, buddy. Oh, hey, what's up, man? Um, so I'm at this mafia restaurant. 
What? I'm going to go in and ask these guys what they think the best pasta shape is. Mark, they're probably eating. I have a hunch that it's probably ravioli, but I mean, you know what? That's a good idea. Whatever they're eating, I'll just take a look in their bowls Why don't and you see what they have. Maybe There's supposed to be a big meeting there today. Can you see it from the street? That sounds really dangerous. So I'm just going to go inside and ask. Don't, don't bother them. They're probably eating, you know. Look, I'm not threatened by them. How about we tell them what the best pasta is on our podcast? We got this with Mark and Hal. Oh, that's a great idea. Thank God. Tuesdays at 9? On MaximumFun.org. Show. Hey there, everyone. We didn't know when this uh, show was going to be broadcast, so get ready, buckle your seatbelts, put your pants on, and time to something, because it's one of my solo ad reads, patent pending. Uh, we have a lot of sponsors this week. Um, well, one sponsor and two Jumbotrons, so... If you count the Jumbotrons as sponsors, we have a lot of sponsors. And our first sponsor is Squarespace. Squarespace. It's a place where you can create a beautiful website. Turn your cool idea into a new website. Maybe you want to write some Sherlock Gnomes fanfic and get that out there in the world. And hey, if some of it's a little erotic, I won't tell. I won't tell Dad and Mom. Alright? You can showcase your work. Announce an upcoming event or special project. Uh, do a little e-commerce, you know, sell some stuff. All that stuff can be done with Squarespace because Squarespace gives you beautiful templates created by world-class designers, uh, functionality that will help you sell anything online, free and secure hosting, and nothing to patch or upgrade ever. They're your one-stop shop, people, for website making. And uh, if you want to get on uh, the website making train. That's what it's called, by the way. Website making. You go to the technical college and they're like, you want to take a class in website making? And you go, yeah. Teach. Anyway, check out squarespace.com slash flop for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code flop to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Squarespace. Hey, we got a couple Jumbotrons here. This first one is a little weird, and it goes like this. Everything is bad. Baskets are very bad. Ours are especially horrible. Please, don't look at me. Also, Valhalla Rising rules, and Snowpiercer is the only thinking person sci-fi movie in decades, except for how Egg Day is somehow cooler than Sushi Day, and also somehow they're the same day. And how eating bugs is somehow grosser than eating babies. But I mean, both of those do make you think. So, and uh, their call to action is to visit shittybaskets.com.net and browse our terrible home goods. Now, you heard me right. It's shittybaskets.com.net. So the .com part is written out with a D-O-T C-O-M. And then there's a period net. So that's that Jumbotron, and I hope you understood it, because I don't. And here's this next one. It's a personal message. It's for Remy. It's from Bill. I think I know these, these Remy and Bill. Uh, good luck to you on your marathon this fall. Or if you can't do it this time for some good reason, good luck when you do. You rule. Uh, I'd like to add my voice to this. Good luck, Remy. Good luck on your marathon. You rule. So those are all of the promotions for this episode. Sorry, as always, for me. And uh, let's get back to the episode. So moving on to letters, uh, we have the first one from Delmar. Delmar. Delmar Pizza? Last name with hell. Yeah. Now, guys, let me just take a minute here to say yeah. I should be doing an Elton John inflected letters song. Uh-huh. Hold me, read me closer, tiny letters, or uh, I can't stop talking about that letter dial rock. Mm-hmm. Also, be crock a letter rock, uh, letter man. Letter day. Yeah, letter, letter day. Yeah, letter, letter day. day. Le- letter day nights all right for letters, or like uh, what else? I believe in letters, or something like. Can you read the letters tonight? I know it's not letters. Or like, 
la 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 letters and the jets. But it turns out I just I thought it's Benny and the Letts. Benny and the Letts is well, that you, people think that's about Tracy Letts. <laughs> <laughs> Benny <laughs> Tracy <laughs> Letts. He's writing lots of plays and Lady Birds. Mm-hmm. He's doing stuff and then he does things. Tracy Tracy Letts. Uh, but. Here's the thing. I just don't know that many Elton John songs, yeah. so I just can't do this Elton John letter parody everyone wants me to do, so I apologize. You know? All right. Uh, anyway. Del Mar. Oh, also, also, wait, wait. If I read a letter, but then again, no. Yep. If I read a letter in a traveling letter show. Yep. Like a letter in the wind. I hope yeah, you yeah, don't write. I one. hope you don't write, because <laughs> then I'll have to read. Oh, that's really good, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I guess that's why they call it letters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I should have said mailbag. That, that fits the blues. Or, uh, I should have said mail. So, but guys, yeah. I just, Neither one sounds like the blues. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be clear. But I guess but I, what I'm saying is I He's guess being I... being charitable to himself. I, I guess yeah. I just don't know enough Elton John songs yeah. when it comes down to it, so I just can't do that. All right. Hmm? Good bit. Anyway, Peaches. Due to its practically holy status to Flophouse lore, I've recently visited a Popeye's. Mm -hmm. While there, it occurred to me that if Elliot were to be executed, his last meal would definitely involve some good, good Louisiana fried chicken. Hell yes, I've thought about it many times. When I tried to think of... Here's my last meal, guys. Yeah. I want Popeye's fried chicken. Uh Uh-huh. Get me a prime rib from Keens in New York, in Manhattan. Uh-huh. It's not going to taste the same if you mail it to me. So you got to take me out of jail and take me to Keens. I like the full I'll experience. Talk to the Lobster bisque. That's what I like to get as the appetizer. Okay. Then I get my prime rib, rare mm-hmm. plus. No, that, n- n- nothing green anywhere near that plate. Mm-hmm. I want to point out my signed pipe that's in the display case in the front, along uh-huh. with all the other comedy pipes. And then I'm going. Yeah, no, no green things except for cream spinach. Mm, yeah. Then. I'm going to go. <laughs> it's delicious. Oh, man. I'm sorry. As I mentioned before on this podcast, my I can't handle uh, milk stuff. So oh, when people talk right. about it, it makes me a little upset. Uh, probably some kind of potato on the side. Uh-huh. It's a steakhouse. You need to have potatoes on the side. Then, uh, and you know what? I like asparagus. A lot of people don't think of that as a steakhouse staple, oh, but yeah. I like it. Oh, yeah. Then, okay. For the, for the pea. Then, then it's off to Popeye's. Oh, I already got a prime rib in my tummy, but it's time to have like probably eight or nine pieces of mild Popeye's chicken. I want it fried up right then, not sitting under the warmer lights for a while. A little bit of red beans and rice. And then it's off to eat an entire molten chocolate cake. And then strap me into old Bessie and light me up. It's time for me to ride the lightning into the into the netherworld. <laughs> you explode couple of, couple of, <laughs> as soon as the electricity hits you. Yeah. Couple, couple of Cokes? What are you? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm drinking Coke at all time. Uh, maybe a couple, you know, like, uh, you know what? I'll even try some of those weird handmade sodas. No, oh, I don't want cool. that. My last meal, forget it. I just want, give me a four liter bottle of Coca Cola yeah. and I'll just chug that on down. Uh, uh, let's move on to the rest of the letter. <laughs> when I tried to think of what meals Stuart and Dan would order, I drew a blank. So, fellas, what would each of you have for your last meal? Am I right that Popeyes is just too tempting for Ellie to pass up? Well, you know, first I would go Delmar. to Keens. No. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, let's see, what would I have for my last meal? I think I might have a little. Uh, Fatty barbecue brisket. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. Just a little bit, because you're well, watching your figure before you die? A lot. Uh, I mean, as long as I'm going as long as long I'm going the barbecue route, I'll just keep on going with that. Maybe have some sausage. Uh, the ribs. Ribs. Uh, some Frito pie. Oh, wow. Oh, sure, yeah. You're not, you, look, it's... Look, I'm still, I'm not, I don't need to watch my figure anymore. Yeah, a, li- a minute on the lips, a lifetime of eternity in a coffin. <laughs> and then for dessert, I think I would have... Uh, a big slice of strawberry rhubarb pie. Slice <laughs> <Less> pizza. <laughs> Stra- <laughs> strawberry rhubarb pie. Probably with a little, with a little vanilla ice cream on the side. Uh-huh. What if it was pizza with ice cream on on the top of it? Uh, I it would be gross. I mean, what do you I don't mean, know. I once if- had a pa- I had once had pizza with mashed potatoes on it. Yeah, and it was delicious. And mashed potatoes looks kind of like ice cream sometimes. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. Well, yeah. I guess you checkmate for me. <laughs> uh, and what are you washing all that down with? Milk. <laughs> it's a big old glass of milk. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, like milk might not be bad with a pie. I know I'm not. Uh, you don't like lactose, but uh, yeah, I uh, so I would have like I mean like I would either go with iced tea to keep with the barbecue the wrapper stuff, or I would have like some like I mean he'd probably be good dinner company. Some rye whiskey with the, yeah, okay. on the rocks. Wait, what's on the rocks? Rye whiskey. I don't think they're gonna give you. Alcohol. Maybe okay. they do. I don't know. Do they give you alcohol before you last before you get killed? I'll ask the warden. Okay. Uh, Jack Warden, the late Jack Warden. <laughs> yeah. Uh Warden the college? 
Yeah, yeah. You'll ask Wharton. Uh, you yeah, ask I'd, Edith Wharton. I'd, I'd probably do. I'd probably do Indian food. Uh, I would probably uh, like a family style. Just give me a lot of everything. I have a tendency. That's Indian food's one of those things where I my brain kind of shuts off the like stop eating function, mm-hmm. and so by the time I'm done, I'm like, oh my god, what did I do? I I don't know if I can make it home. <laughs> that's me with Chinese food. I my, my my brain is just like, oh yeah, your your stomach is a bottomless bag, right? Mm-hmm. Just keep shoveling Chinese food in there, yeah. and then I get so full and my tummy hurts. So like I'll you know, and I like to mix it up. So you you got your biryanis, you got your bunas, you got I'd have a couple of lamb dishes, a couple of veggie dishes. I like okra. Give me that okra, yum yum yum. And dessert, I would uh, drink a six pack of beer. <laughs> 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 All right, yeah, sure. Uh, well, guys, good news. We've been sentenced to death. <laughs> oh, cool. So we're all going to get our special meals. All our dreams are coming true. Yeah. Uh, this next letter is from Walker, last name withheld. Comma, Texas Ranger. <laughs> I was waiting for that. Uh, who writes, Dear Floppers, I have a distinct memory of going to the video store with my mom as a kid. That's a door. That's wonderful. What, next letter? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's sweet that you have those special memories. <laughs> Not really a question, but I guess... <laughs> And admiring the box art and design of Wes Anderson's Rushmore. Uh-huh. When she said she was looking for something to watch, I told her to get that one, and she did. The next day, I asked her what it was about, and she told me, a high schooler who falls in love with his teacher, and at the end, he dies of hypothermia trying to save a guy from drowning in a lake. Wait, what? <laughs> this really stuck with me. And when I eventually watched Rushmore, maybe 10 years later, I spent the entire time waiting for a sudden tragic turn that never came. Mm-hmm. I have two questions. One... Have you ever had misinformation about a movie or its ending affect your viewing experience just as much as an actual spoiler might have? And two, what the hell was my mom talking about? <laughs> Thanks, Walker, last name withheld. Yeah, very, uh, that's like uh, when when I didn't do the reading and somebody explained to me what happens in Bridge to Terabithia. <laughs> You're like, wait, so they never get to Terabithia? What? Uh, the, yeah, I had a situation like that with, uh, what was it, uh, The Dark Knight Rises, which, which the third? The third one, yeah. So I I had tickets to like a fancy IMAX screening, but it wasn't until. Fancy just, like you had to wear a bow tie? Yeah, it was uh, it was black tie only. <laughs> um, and it was, uh, it was a couple days after release. I think it was like the Wednesday after release. And I, <laughs> I had gotten off a bartending shift and I was in the bodega getting a sandwich and some drunken guys were talking about it and one guy's like yeah and then Bane breaks Batman's back and kills him and I'm like fuck dude why do I have to hear this so I went in being like wow Batman's gonna fucking die from a broken back in this movie so that totally changed my perception (laughs) considering he heals himself from a broken back yeah I mean he's Batman dude he can do anything he wants I, th- there's, I realized something. I was just thinking about this for some reason in the shower the other day. That at the end of Dark Knight Rises, he and Catwoman have escaped. Spoiler alert: have escaped to Italy uh-huh. and are just living a private life. And it was almost like Bat, like the idea that Batman, after saving Gotham from that neutron bomb or whatever it is, uh-huh. was like, you know what? I've done enough crime fighting. I feel like I've filled the the gap left by my dead parents. I'm good. I'm calling it quits now. Like the idea that I he, mean, I think it's possible for that character to reach that point in his life. I mean, for a normal That's all I can hope for. For a normal person, I think he, he is totally fair saying like I did my part. You guys do the rest. But it just didn't seem very funny to me that Batman who's presented as this like this unending need for justice that he was like, mm, I think I did it." I mean, and I nailed it. Various, go- <laughs> various plot points aside, I'm assuming that's one of the reasons why diehard Batman fans don't like that movie. Yeah. I mean, wait, was Batman in a diehard movie? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you might know him as Hans Gruber. <laughs> wait, he's the bad guy? Yeah, he is. It's crazy. Now the- I so want to see a diehard, like a John McClane Batman crossover. Uh I don't feel like you would be satisfied with the results. No, probably the, not. I mean, the I mean, I feel like that kind of an ending for Batman is better than Joel Schumacher's argument, where he's like, uh, "It's been a long time. I think Batman would get over the death of his parents. Why is he mo- like brooding about it all the time?" I mean, except that like there is something like uh, I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine who I won't mention by name, but his whose father was murdered similarly when he was a kid, and he was like, "Yeah, I had to deal with it." I didn't dress up in a costume and go fight crime. And I was like, actually, you make you make a good point. A lot of people have to deal with the death of their parents, and they don't do it by dressing up like an animal and punching criminals. But in the I face. mean, that's all, that's like defining the character, though. That's like being like, hey, Batman, what you're doing, stupid. Like, okay, movie's done. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Uh, as for Rushmore in particular, I may have told this story on the 
podcast before, but I remember... You thought it was about Guts and Borglum sculpting Mount Rushmore. Well, that was... The, no, on the on the DVD for uh, Rushmore, they have a Charlie Rose interview from the Charlie Rose show. And Charlie Rose is talking to Jason Schwartzman and, and Wes Anderson. And he keeps saying, like, oh, you know, Max Fisher is this young man who wants to have his face on Rushmore. And, like, they never go, like, what? <laughs> they never go, like, what the hell are you talking about? But... I think it's in Royal Tenenbaums. It's like it, there's in a later Wes Anderson movie, there's something that's clearly a parody of Charlie Rose. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's the result of like Charlie Rose just like not, not understanding. watching the movie or whatever happened to that's make him funny. do that. I don't, I don't know if I don't can't remember something where like it was given the wrong ending and it threw me off. But I remember I may have talked about this on the podcast before. What was that? What's that movie with Steve Gutenberg where it's all those Irish ghosts? High spirits. High, spirits. High spirits. With Piero Tool. With Piero I remember that coming out when I was a kid. And a kid, when I was little. And a kid being like, oh yeah, I saw that movie, High Spirits. And I was like, what happens in it? And he told me the most horrifying tale of like <laughs> sexual violence, of like women being stabbed with between the legs. He's like, yeah, yeah, this woman, it's a hundred years ago. And she, and this guy like stabs her in, in her private parts and all this terrible. And he's like, goes on and on describing this horrifying story. And it like for years, I would see that in the video store. I'd be like, oh, I can never watch that movie. Like that's terrifying. And then getting to a point where I was old enough that I like, was just like, hold on a second. How is that in any way what could have happened in this Steve Gutenberg <laughs> movie? And just wondering, I don't remember who the kid was, but I remember so vividly the story he was telling me, and I just being like, whatever happened to that kid? <laughs> like, what was living in that boy's brain? Yeah, where, where is this skull traveled to? <laughs> yeah. Although, to be fair, since my son is nonstop talking about chopping my body into pieces and uh-huh. just shoving things in my face, yeah. it might just be what little boys talk about, yeah. is the most violent things they can think of. Uh, this next letter is from Henry I mean, last name. Johnny Ryan's made an entire <laughs> comic book career out of that. Good point. Uh, uh, book of Henry? Yeah, Book of Henry writes, Dear Flibbity Florps, what are your favorite edits for TV? I'm specifically thinking audio, but maybe there are some good, bad, confusing cuts out there, too. My favorite was a broadcast of The Big Lebowski when Walter is confronting Larry about the missing million bucks. Uh, instead of, this is what happens when you fuck a stranger in the ass, it says, this is what happens when you find a stranger in the Alps. <laughs> Keep doing whatever it is you do between flop housing, a stranger, not in the Alps. Uh, I think my favorite, I have two favorite edits. One is because when I was a kid, we watched Ferris Bueller all the time, and we have the TV version. So there's just the part, a lot of like, it just very obvious ones, where it's like, I'm not saying Cameron is tight, but if you took a, put a piece of coal in his fist, in a week you'd have a diamond when the line is up his ass. Yeah. Where he goes... It goes, pardon my French, but you, sir, are a moron. And just as a kid being like, it's not that bad. But there's, I remember seeing a TV edit on like WPIX of Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and they didn't want to show someone masturbating on screen. So it looked like Phoebe Cates actually was trying to seduce Judge Reinhold's character. <laughs> and then it came back and it went to commercial. And it came back to commercial. I'm like, are none of the characters talking about how Phoebe Cates was just like coming up to Re- Judge Reinhold? <laughs> like the idea that this is a fantasy of his was totally erased. How do they uh, even edit that? I mean, like, that's they just showed, scene is so much about Phoebe Cates' breasts. Like, how they like reframed the shot, okay. kind of, so that seems it, like it was a lot of work up. for that movie. Yeah, I mean, at that point, just don't put the movie on WPIX. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I think I think my favorite one was just coming to America when he's yelling out of his balcony. When people are yelling "fuck you," they're all yelling "forget you," and he's like "forget you too." Yeah, it's a moment of love. You know, yeah. it's great. We come to America. We had a taped off HBO, so I got all of that. Not that was uh-huh. when we were kids. These are the movies we watched: Teen Wolf, Coming to America, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, The Dark Crystal, and Gremlins. I think when was, we and Ghostbusters was the only movies we watched. I think when we first got uh, like cable or a satellite dish or something, that was when we first got Comedy Central. Coming to America was on Comedy Central. Ah, uh, I see. Not... So they probably cut out the part where he was taking a bath. Also, yeah. I'm going to read one last very quick letter from Mike, last name with hell. Mm-hmm. Mike of the Mechanics. Who just writes. I was going to say Mike of the Mad Dog. Vin Diesel and Eddie Deason in D's Nuts. <laughs> and that's all he writes. Yeah, I'll watch it. There, sure. There are a couple of orderlies. <laughs> now, I would love. So, in that one, I assume Eddie Deason is Vin Diesel's dad mm-hmm. in the movie. Uh, or maybe They're not like. not the same age. Uh, Eddie Deason's a little bit older uh-huh. than Vin Diesel, seeing okay. how Eddie Deason's heyday was the 80s, uh-huh. and Vin Diesel's heyday is right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, or maybe, what, maybe that like... Capable of playing high school to 35. Actually, here's, I would call it D's guys, 
Here's how I'd pitch this movie. Okay. Vin Diesel is a super spy. He's basically like a Xander... What's his last name? Xander Cage, Fast and Furious type guy. What's his Fast and Furious character? Uh, Rolo Tomasi or something? <laughs> it's, uh, Phoebe Newworth? Uh, people are shouting into their eyes. Sweet, sweet right Donnie Pickles? What is I it? I had it, but then the, the deluge of fake names. Ricky Steamboat? <laughs> Driven it from my brain. At Corvus. Dominic Toretto. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're right. Dom yeah. Toretto. Dom Toretto. So he's, he's one of those he types of characters. He doesn't have friends, guys. He's, he's, he's one of those types fans. of characters. He's a super tough guy. And Eddie Deason is his uncle. And Eddie Deason's, like, for whatever reason, he, he can't pay his bills. He's thrown out of his house or something like that. Uh-huh. And he's got to go live with Vin Diesel. And Vin Diesel, and he's, he just won't. He, like, wants to hang out with his nephew because they never really got to know each other uh-huh. and so Eddie Deason is trying to tag along with Vin Diesel as he goes on like a big spy mission you know? oh okay I like so that's it. so that's what I and you probably wouldn't call it D you probably wouldn't and have D in like, the title because they wouldn't be playing themselves <laughs> and Vin Diesel's trying to like he's trying to use his uncle's cover so they go to like Monaco or something yeah yeah and he it's under the you know illusion that they're going on a, a vacation together, but it's actually you know. it's actually a spy thing. But Eddie Deason doesn't know he can't. He has to keep it a secret that he's a spy. Yeah, that makes and, sense. And Eddie Deason keeps like stumbling through these spy things mm-hmm. and being like, "Oh, this is great guy," you know that kind of stuff. Uh, and it, and maybe the bad guys think Eddie Deason's the spy. Oh, uh, mm-hmm. it looks you kill. Exactly. Yeah, that's the move, and I would call it like. D's nuts. I think we already talked about like, it. Yeah, D's nuts. Or like, or like the spy's uncle or something like uh. that. My nephew is a spy. Spy's uncle's the, like the John Le Carre version. <laughs> uh, all right. So that was a great letter segment, guys. A plus. Okay. Thanks for the grade. Uh, I'll just put that on my wall. Let's go say, yeah, on the fridge right now. <laughs> but Any comments? Uh, just says great jorb. I could have remembered. <laughs> great jorb. Uh, <laughs> great jorb. Even when he's writing, he can't say it right. Oh, that's yeah. weird. Okay. <laughs> it's not even an exclamation point. <laughs> I don't. I don't know what a jorb is, but I did it really well. Uh, but we got to do our last segment of the show, which is recommendations: movies that we watch that you should watch probably instead of. Sherlock Gnomes. I almost said Gnome and Juliet. It's hard to not. It's hard, yeah. Especially since we haven't seen the first one, so I don't have a separate movie in my head. So they should have called this Gnome and Juliet 2, Sh- The Rise of Sherlock Gnomes or something like that. But I think that makes sense. Yeah. What do you think the third movie's going to be? Uh, I, I mean, I, Gnome Country for Old Men's uh, possible. That's pretty good, yeah. Uh, I mean, I already said the rise and fall of the Gnome and Empire. That was my best one that mm-hmm. I could come up with. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Uh... Yeah. Noam Chomsky's yep. new book. Yeah, it's called Noam Chomsky. <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> yeah. the theme song is uh, a parody of Duran Duran's Is There Something I Should Gnome? Mm-hmm. Mm. Who Could It Be Gnome? Yep. It's the song. <laughs> <laughs> Who could it be gnomes? Do, 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 do. Uh, Who could it be I'm sorry, I gnomes? I <laughs> Immediately regret it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Dan, are we going to recommend some movies? Sure, I'll recommend one. Yeah. Uh, so, I'm going to disappoint everyone, even though I came to Seattle on a plane. Mm-hmm. The only movie I watched on the plane was all right. It was okay. Wow, okay. You know, some would even say this is information that doesn't need to be related to the <laughs> listeners. <laughs> <laughs> I think people were How was your snack bread. on the plane, Dan? <laughs> people hear that I've been on a plane, and they're curious to see if I watched a movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. I did watch movies. It was Battle of the Sexes. It was all right. That's what I've heard about Battle of the Sexes. It's just okay. Uh... So instead, I'm going to go the other direction and not surprise anyone, do a really obvious pick, which is I saw Incredibles 2 on my birthday, and Mm -hmm. it was predictably very good. Now, Uh, were you, like the New Yorker's Anthony Lane, totally turned on? I was totally boned out, (laughs) but... You, you couldn't hold on to your popcorn because you were so <laughs> so sexed up by what you're seeing. I stole someone else's popcorn because they didn't have any popcorn. I put it over my boner, and then my popcorn went flying. Now I'm wondering <laughs> no, wait, why you stole wait, so it much. Flew off your body? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's so much. There's just so much sprawling. Yeah. When, when his penis when his penis did, telescoped did the, out as it does did into you say the boner. The popcorn flew off your body, or the boner flew off your body. <laughs> he had such a power of a boner that it it managed to fling itself off of his yeah, yeah, body yeah. Wee, with a tearing sound. Yeah, like a, like a, yeah, like a Greek myth. It, it, it's imbued with life. Yeah, much as the, if the Discobolus came to life and finished throwing that discus, it would fly off into the horizon. That's what happened with, with Dan's erection. So Incredibles 2, bonerfying? 
Totally boner Okay. It was a good movie? Yeah, I, it, it, I think that it suffers a little from not having as straight ahead a, a, a story as the first movie. Like, it has a little bit of, like, sequelitis of, like, why exactly are we telling this story? It doesn't need to be told again. Are there like, two villains in it? Uh, I don't want to spoil it. Okay, don't but. spoil it. Because I know there, I'm not a huge fan of the, it's the next movie in the series, we got to add one more villain yeah. to the total number of villains. I think that the strongest thing about Incredibles 2, though, is... is Mr. Incredible. Because he's super strength. <laughs> That's a, he's got a good point. <laughs> yeah. All right, the second strongest thing is the action sequences. Because it's done in animation, it, like... It has the the craziest, most kinetic clockwork action sequences, and Brad Bird is very good at working that stuff out. And uh, it can do stuff that, like, in a normal superhero movie, I'm like, I'm kind of sometimes feeling like, what's the physics of this thing? Like that, even if they're superheroes, that wouldn't happen that way. It bothers me. And you're like, who's stronger, Aquaman or Cyborg? Uh huh. But in an animated movie, like, because the physics those are, the, are so elastic. Those are the two. You're like, I don't need to know about the super strongest guys. What about the guys at the middle level? Yeah, Who's yeah. the strongest of them? Huh? Well, that's uh, when, when you see, like, when Vulture ranks, like, all the Beatles songs ranked. I don't care about what they think the best song is. I about Vulture, the super villain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, wow, he's got opinions on fucking Beatles songs? When I, go I to guess a- he's old. When I go to Adrian Toomes' blog, <laughs> and he ranks all the episodes of the Rockford Files... I'm not interested in what's the top or the bottom. I can guess those. I want to know what's in the middle. <laughs> yeah. I know. Uh, look, you're going to rank all the Beatles songs. I know you know my name. Look up the number. is going to be number one. And I know that exactly. most of George Harrison's more experimental or John Lennon's experimental songs will be at the bottom. So look. Uh, and if you, it's like if you ranked all the Beach Boys songs, you know Kokomo is dead last because it's the worst song in human history. <laughs> this is uh, – I had a moment recently apparently – my son, uh, my wife had to text me about this, that there was a ice cream truck playing Kokomo, and my son turned to her and said, what's this song? This is a good song. Oh, and it, it cut me to the quick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, anyway, so you're saying Incredibles 2 has a little bit of sequelitis, but otherwise, but otherwise yeah, the strongest thing is the action sequences because Brad Bird knows what he's doing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's and, pretty much all and, I have to say about it. It's bonerfying, I think. And super totally bonerfying. Super yeah. worth seeing, though. Super worth seeing because it's a superhero movie. Super I think you're right, right Elliot. Give me a, give me another pun. Give me another superhero pun. Uh, it's superb. I'll allow it. I mean, I mean, there are other words than super. You gotta call it high flying or something like that. Oh, okay, I got you. I didn't yeah. know that was the whole of the world with my sandbox. <laughs> yep, <laughs> very much so. <laughs> okay, Elliot, what are you recommending? I'm gonna go the opposite route, and I'm gonna do something a little different for me and recommend an old movie. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, I recently watched, watched a movie called The Purchase Price from 1932. It's a Barbara Stanwyck movie from this period when, in the early 30s, when Barbara Stanwyck was making these kind of super short movies about women forced to kind of find their own way in the world. And this movie, she's a like she's a singer in a club who is dating a mobster but is engaged to a rich heir to a rich family. When the heir finds out she's been dating this mob, she breaks up with the mobster. The heir finds out she's been dating a mobster and dumps her, and the mobster wants to get back together with her, so she wants to escape. And she runs off and, through a series of events, becomes the mail-order bride of a wheat farmer out in the country mm-hmm. and has to deal with suddenly being in this strange position where she is married to a man that she doesn't really know, and also the man starts to doubt. She, he suspects her when she doesn't give herself to him on the first night, and... He, so she has to figure out how does she win his trust back and also does she want to be there and eventually it all hinges on whether his new wheat strain that he's been breeding whether they can successfully cultivate enough to save the, save the farm from the bank Interesting. and this movie is 70 minutes long okay. and it has so much random plot in it and Barbara Stanwyck is great in it and it's directed by William Wellman so there are sequences that look fantastic uh, there's just like a lot of interesting shots in it, but it feels like I'm a big fan of Guy Madden, and it feels like the kinds of movies Guy Madden is drawing on a lot, mm. where the plot does not follow a straight line. It is all over the place, and it is more like it's almost more like a uh, a sequence of of scenes or moments that are only tenuously connected in some ways, and the ending is so abrupt, and the emotions in it are so strange. The man she becomes married to is such a jerk. And she becomes so devoted to him. And that's the one thing I found really problematic about it is that she falls in love with this guy who's just a total asshole to her. But I, but it's it. My, the 30s is my favorite time in Hollywood. I mean, that's kind of Empire Strikes Back, too. 
Yeah, I mean, most movies, yeah. Uh, the 30s is my favorite time in Hollywood history, partly because they were making these movies. They were churning them out so fast that, like, there's this weird dream logic to a lot of them. And I don't want to overstate how weird this movie is, but you watch it and you get kind of whiplash a few times of, like, wait, what is going on in this movie? And I was like, the mobster is still looking out, looking for her. And it's like, if this movie was made now, she would go to the farm, this mobster would catch up with her, and the got the the husband would have to fight the mobster to save her and like prove himself that way. And the mobster would be a real threat. And instead events just kind of like happen anyway. I don't, it's a, anyway, I enjoyed it a lot, but it's a movie that you can't watch through the eyes of a modern day movie viewer. Or if you do, you want to watch it through the eyes of someone who's ready for just kind of things to happen and to dissipate as they do, you know, like as they will in the movie. So it's called the purchase price. I enjoyed it a lot, but if you don't like old movies, Oh boy. Just oh, go man. watch No Me or Sherlock <laughs> keep, Gnomes. Keep walking. Keep walking. It's in black and or white. So I got two quick recommendations. The first is a movie called Assassination Games. Game? I can't remember which one. It's uh, a a uh, action, a cheapy action movie starring my man Scott Adkins and Jean-Claude Van Damme. So like the modern Jean-Claude Van Damme and the old Jean-Claude Van Damme. Uh, this is from, I think, 2011. And Scott Adkins has crack, uh, cranked out a lot of these action movies. Some of them are really great, like, uh, you know, Ninja 2, Shadow of a Tear. And I think Close Range was the other one I really liked. This is a little older. The action scenes aren't quite as good. However, it's worth coming. It's worth watching, if only for the completely unbelievable uh, villains uh, that are in the movie. Like, the Interpol agents totally aren't believable as Interpol agents. And the mobsters are not scary at all. Uh, there's a weird amount of violence toward women, so don't watch if you, that. I mean, it's that's pretty weird. If you don't love however, violence towards women, <laughs> I mean, that's a yeah, that's a weird qualification, I suppose. Um, however, what's great about it is Jean Claude Van Damme's performance in this movie is hilarious, and there is a sensual turtle stroking scene. <laughs> so watch it for that. Uh, the movie that I'm uh, is not a qualified recommendation that I'm going to recommend quickly because I don't want to go too deep into spoilers or anything. Is Hereditary. A uh, new horror movie that may or may not still be in theaters. Uh, Tony Collette's in it. Uh, it's great. It's filled with dread. I want to see that. Um, it reminds me a lot of... Uh, it feels like a movie that was heavily inspired, not necessarily plot-wise, but just the way that like it's shot and the way that people deal with stuff by... It, it reminds me a lot of Japanese horror films. Hmm. Um, and it's... It, there and there's moments in it that are just are so like kind of stark and shocking and beautiful like it's a it's a very it's a very interesting looking movie uh so yeah uh go be stressed out all right uh well it's been one week since you looked at me <laughs> da, 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 da. yeah do you guys ever realize that uh bare naked ladies is basically children's music uh, sure. Like the I mean, way, uh, yeah. People or or college students with the taste of children. Yeah, I guess that's it. I was I was I mean, thinking about I was hearing some in a car recently, and I was like, if I went to a bare naked ladies concert, it would feel like I was going to a Wiggles concert. I don't know a lot of bare naked ladies, but I do know the song Old, Dan, old Apartment. You get around. You know plenty of bare naked ladies. Yeah, because that show was playing in uh, Earlham all the time. So you know the song Old Apartment. No, right? I don't like, think I know that it's, one. That has like a lot of like wistful adult feelings oh, that okay. I think don't uh, that like a kid would not understand. I mean, it's about like it's like the lyrics are broken to our old apartment, and it's a, and it's like this is where we used to live, and it's oh, about okay. how like it's a classic. You, this used to be my playground type song. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and like how the new owners have changed everything around, and like oh, that's a little different. Okay, yeah. That's fair. Well, the, and yeah, and like and the the difficulty of getting older. It's mm-hmm. like uh, Johnny's Back by the band Riot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which is okay. all about like you know not liking change and just trying to get back into the old swing of things even though it isn't quite the same anymore that's kind of mm-hmm. how i always feel about the boys are back in town it sounds like a really sad song to me because <laughs> mm-hmm. i think it's supposed to be like yeah the boys are back we're having fun but it always feels like hey the boys are back mm-hmm. well okay we're not boys anymore so like go do your you, stuff you i've must, got things to do you must be listening to the bruce springsteen version <laughs> <laughs> So this is a weird way of ending the show. Like sad. I mean, and, like and do- dragging the bare naked ladies. Sad and like unrelated <laughs> to anything else we've talked about. Hey, look, you're the one who said one week. <laughs> I guess so. 
I don't no, 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 you said it's week. been. Said you said it's been. been. <laughs> so I guess it's off me. Yeah, Dan, never say anything that can be misconstrued as the lyrics to a song. Yeah. So hey, you said it's been, and I interrupted you. What were you going to say? Uh, it's been 260-some episodes, and I still don't really know how to end this podcast. So, Well, usually we just do it by talking about bare naked ladies for a little bit. Yeah. The, more, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Mm-hmm. Look, goes around, gnomes around. All right, on that note. No, wait. What gnomes around, gnomes, gnomes around. around. <laughs> gnomes around. Yeah. Uh, uh, for for the flop house, I've been Dan McCoy. Yeah, you are. I'm Stuart Wellington, and this is Elliot Kalen, not Elliot McCoy. This is the goofer layer. My last name's Kalen. See you guys. Peace. Can we try one more? That's <laughs> right. Let's try one more. <laughs> Wait, I, just, I still don't think I have anything. But on this episode, we discuss. Sherlock gnomes. Uh, Dan, you misspoke. I think you mean Sherlock Holmes. Oh, no, wait, I get it, because they're gnomes. <laughs> Can't stop me. No, I got like Stuart's one. All right, and three, two. Oh, wait, uh, wait, let's try one more. I got one more. <laughs> On this episode, we discuss Sherlock gnomes. The movie that dares to answer the question, hey, what if Sherlock Holmes was a gnome? All right. <laughs> yeah, we did it. And three. Wait, wait, okay. Another couple? No. Wait, wait, let's do one more. <laughs> <laughs> On this episode, we discuss Sherlock Gnomes. Spoiler alert Holmes and Gnomes rhyme. The movie. Maximumfun.org. Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Listener supported. Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to the Ghibli cast, the show where we go through every single Ghibli movie one by one. We've already done, I think, four of these. And if you haven't seen them all, they're in a playlist on this channel. The first three were on the Procrastinators channel, and we are the Procrastinators, consisting of Digibro, myself, and the Dabu co-host. Alternate title is, no matter how I see it, it's your guys' fault I'm not magical. <laughs> Hippocrit. The Sabrina the Teenage Postman. Oh. And for the first time on Ghibli Cast, we're joined by Ben Saint. Hey, everybody, I'm here at last. I, I, I love anime. And I'll, no, you don't. Good, goodbye, I'll see myself out. No. Um, no, I do. Yeah, I do. This, this is anime, right? And I liked it, so I like anime. We're talking about Kiki's Delivery Service, and Ben, you specifically wanted to be on this one because I think you said this was one of your favorite movies. This is my favorite Ghibli. I haven't, I haven't seen them all. I, ha- I haven't seen like Porco Rosso or probably some no other one's ones. seen Porco Rosso. Everyone <laughs> who says they've seen Porco Rosso is lying. <laughs> I've ha- seen it, and I like that one, but uh, we'll get to it. Um, but yeah, this is my favorite Ghibli. I'm excited because I know Digi has described this one as one of his lesser favorite Miyazaki's, and I'm like, ugh. I hate really? it whenever someone has a lesser opinion, and I, I mean, rewatching it, I'm like, uh, I think it's also one of my lesser favorite Miyazaki's. Why can't someone have a you positive opinion? Fucking asshole! I know. I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed. I could <laughs> well, never I'll be. I'll tell a you what. I have changed my opinion on this movie almost every time I've seen it because the first time I watched it, it was the first Miyazaki film I actually liked. Back when I was younger, I, I didn't like his movies for the most part until this one. Um, the last time I watched it, I concluded it was my least favorite. This time, I'm just like, yeah, it's a good movie. Like, I, I'm kind of, it's not my favorite by any stretch, but, uh, I think I like it probably more than Laputa, but, I don't know, it's close. It's close between the two. I've never seen this one before, and I, uh, I don't know, I, it's, I'm conflicted about it. I'm not sure that I like it a lot. It's okay, but, like, it's just sort of, I just, I, watching Ghibli... F- uh, films very recently. This doesn't stack up to Totoro. This doesn't stack up to. Doesn't stack up to Totoro. There are things that I don't like about it. To be sure. Uh, to be sure. Mostly, mostly spoilers. The ending. Uh, but, but we can talk. I finally, you know, I always hated the ending of this movie until this viewing, and I still don't love it. But I understood what the point of it was finally. Yeah, but we'll I, get to that way. I disliked it less. This is this is my second time seeing it, uh, and I disliked it less this time than I did the first time. Well, Ben, I I just want to ask you right off the bat, um, what do you like so much about this movie? I think 
what I like about it is just it's it's just nice and like I really like Kiki and I like I just I guess I just like the whole conceit of like her moving to a new town and then starting a fucking business. I don't know, it's just nice. I I felt like so much of the movie was not about Kiki or the delivery so I mean it's about Kiki, but like isn't that likable a lot of the time. She's just a teenager. Okay. And, and the delivery true. surface doesn't have much to do with anything. Um, well, okay, one thing that I have a... One thing that bothers me, and it's not a problem with the movie, but it really bothers me, is that Kiki is, like, the shittiest witch. Um, and she seems perfectly content with that. Like, okay, her skill, like, like she meets the other girl who's a fortune teller, and, like, her mom does potions and whatever. Her skill is flying on a broom, which is something that literally any witch can do. And also, also what she is awful at. Yeah. 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 Well, the <laughs> thing is, that fortune teller witch is probably a lot older than her. Probably late no, no. Or she, no, no, she was a, she was exactly a year old, because she was just finishing her, uh, her Well, year that's the abroad. thing. I, I would say that that, like, I would say that one year is exactly the year Kiki needs to become someone who has a thing like that, you know? She does need it, but it seems like she's not going to get it because she seems content to run a delivery service. She doesn't seem like she aspires to do anything um, more with her powers. Could we not assume that she will become really adept at flying through the... I mean, at the end of the movie, she, through sheer force of will, uses, like, a shit broom to do, like, a harrowing rescue. So, like, it's... We yeah. could sort of surmise that maybe she will get really good at flying. Eh, I don't. I don't think the movie suggests that she will, or that she, or that she has potential to be a great flyer. This, this is, this is no. She's no Harry Potter. Fellow, I don't think. Fellow, I think it's fellow less anime accurate fans. to say that she's that it's wrong that she's shit at flying. I think it's a little bit more accurate to say the movie's title is a bit of a red herring. I just think of the delivery service as her desperate move to keep her fucking self fed. This is, like, supposed to be, like, the first sure. episode of her entire series that is her coming-of-age story. This was just Act 1. I could, yeah, I would say that. Like, the delivery service is her fucking day job. The title definitely gave me a, a weird impression when I got into the movie and I realized it... Like, I was confused about what the, the point of it was. Like, was it about how the city is not as good as living in the country? Or, or about, like, growing up or, or something? Or was it about starting a business? I don't really know. It was just sort of, at some point, you kind of understand that it's about her getting over being a teenager, sort of. Whenever you get sucked into a what is the point of the movie hole, like, unless the movie is terrible or you don't want to rewatch it, rewatch it and, and then ruminate on it. And if it's still really confused and scattershot, then it's confused and scattershot. But a lot of times, people just think a movie doesn't have a point, but you just have to watch it again, you know? You I, have to, I, like, I, don't, I don't think the movie is confused or scattershot. Like, I agree that the, the delivery service itself is only, like, a part of what's going on here. Uh, like, it's not really about the delivery service, it's about Kiki. Uh, that's fine. Why wasn't it bread? Why was she not delivering bread? I do not understand why she, it was not a delivery weird. series. That's weirded me out every time, that, like, why wouldn't it just be that the bakery has her be their delivery person? Like, well, why is Because they had to come up with so unique separate? scenarios to, for her to fuck up on. Do, do they, does she yeah. do that at all? Does she ever no. deliver bread? It is no. never. She, she <laughs> watches the it's store. It's really weird, because why would anyone come to that store for a delivery service? Wouldn't they just... I mean, now that she's famous at the end of the movie, it's obvious why they'd come there. But, like... Why wouldn't they just go to the fucking post office? It would be office? funny, though, if she does develop the skill of, like, actual baking. Like, she can summon yeast from the molecules in the air or something. Because that seems to be all she does for, like, half the movie. This is may Maybe this is a bit cynical, but uh, I, I think that maybe it's just the novelty. Like, they probably could just send a letter by the post office, but maybe they just think it's cool to have a witch deliver their shit. I mean, that's certainly why the first woman does it. Because she see you know, she just thinks... She was impressed with what Kiki did already, and is like, I'll come back and be a all of customer. All uh, I mean, I think... Most of the customers are people who need to, like, get something somewhere in a fucking hurry, and maybe the city isn't super well, well laid out to get from place to place, you know? Although it, it seems pretty well laid out. The, the city it seems, seems beautifully well the, laid I, out. I, I feel like possibly another problem with the movie, or like a discordance, some ludonarrative dissonance, you could say, is that the movie is about depression, but the city she's in is fucking idyllic sand. No, shit that's weather. the point. That is the point of the movie. Yeah. So, to, to me... So I'll, I'll just come right out and say what I think this movie's about. It's a it, the the main thrust of this movie is that Kiki is a romantic, and yeah. she doesn't understand why the world is the way it is, and that's her problem. 
All she sees in this town is beautiful city by the sea. She doesn't understand why people would want to live there, like what the culture there is like, what what it means to be in a place like that. And because she, she kind of goes there expecting it to just be the same as her hometown, to just be everyone knows each other, everyone's friendly, you're going to have a place immediately because like she just hasn't seen a world other than that. And then she gets there and she's just like, this isn't what I thought. This isn't, you know, I, all I thought it was going to be is the same kind of life I already lived, except it's in a beautiful town. Yeah, all of, her, uh, all of her Which raises up. the question, yeah. you'd have to ask her, well, then why wouldn't everyone live in a city like that if it was that easy? You know, right. why do you think anyone lives in an idyllic small town? Because there's different reasons to live in different places. Right, so, like, and, and, and like all the, her, her fucking up really starts when she's flying around trying to show off, trying to, like, be like the opening scene of a movie where people react right. to a witch and she's so smug about it that she closes her eyes and fucking like careens down into a fucking tunnel and almost gets arrested and shit so she's trying to like she's she's thinking of this like a storybook and she's thinking of herself right. as the witch character who comes to town and i do think this happens with a lot of real life professions that have this sort of mythology behind them like farmers or i guess gangsters or people with martial arts real life people kind of think of themselves as movie characters when they I get certain jobs that are kind of like portrayed in movies a lot and it's cool yeah. to see how how like mythology fucks up people's perception of how they're supposed to, to do stuff what i like about the town being so idyllic and everything is that kiki is basically surrounded on all sides by actualized people like people who know why they're there who have a sense of purpose who are like in this town for a reason and all of her conceptions of how she's fucking up are all from herself no one no one at any point is like, Kiki, you're a fuck-up. Like, everyone loves her the whole movie. It's all just, like, the discordance between her fantasy of what it's supposed to be like and her actual performance that causes all of her problems. I was kind of annoyed at how, like, very easily she becomes depressed at other people. And, like, that, that first scene where she walks by the, the, you know, the cool girls talking about stuff and she immediately goes full incel and decides to hate them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I... Well, I She's 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 kind of I mean she's a teenager right so why would she would we expect her that to be well adjusted is a, but she she kind of sucks that's a little bit that's the thing that's a little bit more of a thing with girl neat autists more so than boy neat autists which is even more content for normie girls and this is something that's very much put on display in uh, Jellyfish Princess I was watching that with my fiance and I was like they 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 always seem to like have absolute contempt for girls with a good sense of dress. Is that like a girl yeah. thing? And she's like, yes. I, hate I would say very much. Like, Kiki, I understood this movie more from, you know, being with a woman. <laughs> like, having yeah, been absolutely. someone who grew up with no women around at all in my absolutely. life. It definitely helped me to be like, okay, I get these kind of hangups. Like, things that I... Now, granted, I'm also somebody who is hung up on the fact that I look different and, like, see myself as an outsider. And Kiki's entirety of her seeing herself as an outsider is all in her head no one treats her that way at all in the movie there's even a line where she says like did you see the way that, that his friends looked at me and it's like yeah i did see the way they looked at you it was normal they just looked yeah. at you like, yeah, they the, didn't, the, they didn't the, even make a face at you the one scene i relate to the most is I, and i'm sure a lot of people would agree this would be the scene they relate to the most is when she's yucking it up with the striped shirt boy and then all of his friends come out on the junky little yeah. car and she's just like oh people having fun i have contempt for them I, was she like was she like jealous that she that oh. like that he paid attention to them over her or did she just think that like they were outsiders and didn't want them involved it, it, i actually just thought like she th she sees herself as an outsider all the time because she wears a dress that is the witch's dress and she doesn't get to wear like cool clothing or whatever, but like she it it is all in her head. But like in a normal like not a normal movie, but like most movies are about like witches and wizards and stuff being out outsiders and outcasts because people don't you know know what they are and understand them. But in this universe, witches are just normal and people are like oh cool a witch. Yeah, well they're not normal. They're 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 neat. Like people neat. think they're cool. <laughs> I think yeah. I, mean, I might be more qualified to project an assumption as to exactly what she was feeling in that scene when she got all down all of a sudden, uh, is that, at least speaking for myself, around her age, but especially a few years thereafter, I started to realize that when I hang out with a bunch of people who are yucking it up and having fun, I 
can't enjoy the fun with them even when I'm trying. It's a weird thing, and I, I know felt it's... the same, yeah, that was also the most relatable scene for me. It's why I didn't have any fucking friends, because even, even in the event that people were being nice and open with me, I wouldn't reciprocate, and eventually, without some other purpose in life to turn to, it, I started to have to be a bit annoyed by it. I'm like, well, we're just having fun. I guess I'll just go home now. I'm busy. That's exactly what she does. I think in that scene, what she's feeling is like she's, you know, she's an outsider, but she's starting to form this connection with what's his name. Does anyone remember the kid's name? Tom. Tom. Yeah, Tom. 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 What the fuck would that be his name? Anyway, uh, yeah, she's starting to form this connection with Tombo, and, and, it, I'm, and it feels good, and she's, she's opening up. And then these other kids roll up, and I think it's probably a combination of, like, well, this is too much for me to handle at this point in my social development, as well as, like, this is not going the way I expected. Like, I expected to be bonding with this kid, and now suddenly there's all these other kids, and, like, this is not what I expected, and I, and I don't like it. I'm, I'm out. There's something that Econ said that stuck with me, and you, I think you were there for it, where he said, you can't have a conversation with more than four people. And I, oh. I don't know how true that, like exactly is, but I, I would say the feel PCP that is pretty good evidence for it. You it's can just, only, oh, I mean, yeah. yeah. When you get too many people, you start to have multiple. It starts to exactly off. sub conversations, and I think that when she sees immediately with the involvement of these people, Tombo's attention is already split from her. So like the mm -hmm. meaningful connection they were forming there, like he's already having another conversation she's not even a part of. And she's just observing that, like, well, now I feel like I'm the odd man out, because you already know all these people, they're already friends, I'm not going to form meaningful connections with them because we're going to be in a group, so none of them are going to get to know me, we're True. all just going to be swept up in the moment. Like, I personally, I fucking can't stand hanging out with other people, like, my friends other friends i avoid like the fucking plague like i cannot <laughs> yeah. stand yeah. when one of my friends tries to involve me in what their friends are doing because i don't know your friends and like for me the purpose of hanging out with someone is meaningful conversation it's not to just be one more in a group a hive mind if you will because that's what you form when you go above the conversation limit it becomes we're, we're all just down for whatever and that's when you get group think and that's when people start just uh, you know, trying to put on airs and appearances to be a part of the group as opposed to speaking their actual minds. So. I understood why Kiki reacted the way she did, but it still really, really annoyed me. And I felt bad for Tombo. And I was like, Tombo is here. Tombo's doing this nice thing and he's inviting you to hang out with his friends. I would have reacted you... the same way she did. Even well, today. Maybe. <laughs> but, 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 but you, and then she, and for this, and for this, he gets snubbed and, and treated bad. And she was like, you know, yeah. I'm out. See ya. I don't, I don't even necessarily think that it's like terrible that she did that. It's just that the movie, it, it, it gives me a bad, it gave me a bad idea of like, why she would do something like that to the point where I was confused and I was like in tombo shoes like well fucking what the fuck like I felt bad about her because the movie wasn't it was just confusing me about like what is Kiki what is she I don't understand this character that's very fair I felt it completely in her shoes the whole time but I totally yeah. get it not feeling that way. I, I related to that scene probably the most, and I don't I, I don't know. I find her, her easy enough to understand, not necessarily to always relate to, but I mean, I've been through most of the things that she goes through in this movie, and I definitely I, think social I think I've been through all of these things too. I just, it, you know? I, I just, I, well, that's the thing. Like, if she was shown to be more socially awkward in, like, obvious ways, she's so agreeable and nice to most of the people she meets at the beginning of the movie, and then she yeah. gets depressed, and then she's, she's almost bipolar, which is what I don't relate to. The most relatable moment of the movie to me is when she comes... It's when she gets that second call to the old woman's house, and she's depressed and her powers don't work, and she, and she hates her life, and the lady, like, gives her the cake and, like, says she wants to know her birthday, and, like, she starts to cry. Um, because, like, I, I... It's, like, it's... You ever, you ever felt that? You ever just, you ever been sad oh, and then yeah. someone someone does something nice to you and it's like it's too much and like you don't because even you don't know it's how a to, bit of how ego to deal death. with it. It pulls you out of yourself and like reminds you that like other people care about you cuz I think that a big part of Kiki's problem throughout this movie is she okay to to break down why I think her conflict with Tombo happens. Um and I don't think I don't know if this is different in Japanese. I feel like it must be because in Japanese there are formal and informal ways of speaking. And I would bet and 
commenters correct me if I'm wrong, that Tombo has a more informal way of speaking because he's a city kid and she doesn't because she's from the country and she's very polite. And so when she lands in the city, she tries to, you know, politely introduce herself to everybody and they're just kind of like, uh, who the fuck is this weirdo? Let's get out of here. Tombo approaches her, but because of the way he starts the conversation, that he's impolite, he doesn't introduce himself first, he doesn't ask her name, he's just like ranting at her basically. And then she, you know, when she when she gets mad at him, she says like it's not proper to introduce, you know, to talk, talk to before you introduce you yourself. Introduced right. Yourself, yeah. So like even though he legitimately is interested in her and cares about her and thinks she's cool right from the start, because of the way he does it, she rejects it. And so she's still in the mindset of like nobody likes me because it's nobody who I respect likes me. And even with his friends, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. a big part of why she didn't go with them, you have to remember, is that the girl in the car is the girl who she saw at the party and thinks is a piece of shit because she rejected the grandma's pie. So wait, was she in the was she in the car that pulled up? With, yeah, like, when when Tombo the, was yeah, the oh. girl says that girl came to my house to deliver a pie the other day. Like the girl who's in the oh, passenger that's seat right. says yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. So that's I think right. the fact that she thinks that girl's a bitch and that she's also seen these girls walking yeah, she, around she dressed already in nice has clothes, some loser you know. points with them by representing that dumbass pie she didn't like. Were the girls walking around at the beginning in the in the cool clothes? The, the same I think ones they. In the car? I'm I not think, sure. Uh, I think. I mean, they they're were. similar. At the very least, they're like. Similar. I, I, yeah. I, they, I they know might as well be them, the same as far as Kiki's concerned. One of them definitely was the same. So and you know. I, I'm really interested in that part where she goes to the party because every time I'd seen this movie before, I thought, and it seems like if you just read it on the surface, the movie is saying, like, this girl's a bitch. And we're kind of meant to just, like, like, most of us will probably agree with Kiki and Gigi because even Gigi's like, wow, what a stuck-up brat when they're leaving. But then I thought about it, and what the girl says is, I told Grandma not to make me one of these pies. And I thought about it, and I'm like, yeah. you know... Grandma Maybe she's listen. not, yeah, grandma's not really talking to this girl. Like, I mean, obviously she's like a rich, spoiled brat, and the grandma's also rich. They probably don't really talk that much. Grandma's just like, I want to do something nice for my grandkid every year. But grandkid's like, but well, you're not actually doing something nice for me because yeah. I told you I don't like this shit, you know? I want to make my specialty, even though I know you don't, even though I should know you don't like it. The grandma does exactly. seem, in, the grandma is obviously someone who is insistent on, I'm going to fucking old style nice bag your ass, whether you like it or not. The same way she insists on paying Kiki. Before I go any further, I want to say that a herring and pumpkin pot pie sounds fucking sick and I want one. Uh, really, really bad. Um, is that what's uh, in it? Herring and pumpkin? Yeah, herring, herring is a herring a fish, and pumpkin. Right? Yeah. That's interesting. It sounds okay. great <laughs> to me. Um, you sounds, like that sounds, kind of sounds like very New England. Sounds very New England. Old fashioned kind of food. Uh, but yeah, um, that's an interesting observation that like the, the, having hadn't considered that the grandma's like the, the, the girl has she's got her reasons she's not just right. she's not just stuck up and the, again that was something I only connected with because of my relationship because I've literally seen like my uh my fiance's uh not her real grandma like step grandma is like she she constantly like pretends to do nice things for people but she's extremely transparently a bitch and like <laughs> no one in the family likes her at all so she'll like she'll just give you things that you don't care about and act like that's you know enough act like she's done you a big favor right exactly right, right. and a lot of old people are like that in my experience but you know whatever. boomers am i right gamers <laughs> No, the, is that the new generation? Yeah, it's boom, boomers versus gamers. Is the next, uh, the next, the next ink, uh, the next ink, 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 ink fest. You know, considering that there's a fucking dirigible in this movie, I think it might be that Kiki is a boomer. Like, what, <laughs> what era does this so. take place? In? I think it's supposed to take place sometime in. When the I was your age, I so. when I was your age, I paid my way through college and bought myself a house on my fucking delivery service job. Uh, over a summer as a witch. Uh, yes. Boom, boom. There is actually one br very brief moment where you see some, like, modern-looking houses. I think this city's a little bit anti antique and, like, well-preserved. There's even one line in the dub that I listened to. I, li I watched the, uh, the older dub that wasn't Disney. They make a reference to disco. So, I think it's supposed to be the 70s or something, or whoa, whoa, whoa. 67. They, they reference disco? What yeah. drove you to watch this other dub? Like, um, I thought I it sounded a bit better. I, wait, I compared wait, wait. them. When do they reference disco? At the very beginning of the movie, when uh, the girl, when she's seeing her friends at the old 
town off, uh, one of the girls is like, oh, wherever you go, do you think they'll still have discos? I, maybe I misheard the line or something, okay, but I thought that, it was okay, weird. Okay, that, that, might, that might be... Uh, that might not refer to disco the style of music. That might just refer to, like, a, a dance club. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get you the screenshots of the more modern-looking buildings in a second. I'm, I'm. I'm almost got them. I don't think this movie takes place in the 70s. I mean, the cars look pretty fucking old, right? Like, this it's th- it's kind of weird. Yeah. Prepared. The, I did like see the because big... because like the, the generic word for like a dance club in Spanish is disco discoteca, right? All like, right, that's, motherfuckers. That's a word that is we didn't use used... my screenshot is processing my fucking. Come on, I'm trying to show everyone up. F- process the fucking picture. Yeah. Everyone. And then you'll hear the thing and it'll go on screen. <sighs> God, I hope that really is the word. I didn't just make an ass of myself. I'm misremembering high school Spanish. There we go. It's there. Discotheque is French. No, it isn't. Well. There's no caption in this image you posted. What about these buildings Whoa. makes them seem super modern to you? Exactly. Oh, they look oh. way more modern than the rest of the fucking building. Uh, I mean, uh, they city. could be like from the 50s. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert. I mean, on I think this movie goes out of its way to not necessarily be in one specific place. Like, if you look at the signage on buildings, there's a lot of German. There's some English. Um, Kiki's the the bread maker uh, when he makes her sign for her delivery service. It's in Japanese, which I thought was a strange choice because I was like, how many people in this town can read that? Wait, is the signage in English? The sign for their shop is in is in German, and then the sign for Kiki's delivery service is in Japanese. I think this world takes place in some sort of alternate universe where the Axis won World War II. Everything is German and Japanese now. The, the, the pregnant woman, her, she has like a Japanese name, right? She, I remember she had a strange oh, Asana, name. Oh, Asana, yeah, think, her name is Asana. Yeah, so why is, like, Kiki looks Japanese, but her name is Kiki, and which, I mean, I guess that's kind of generic. It could be Japanese. Dude, be what anything. if all the Ghibli films are connected? But yet, and but yet this, this, is, this, this red-haired is... woman, who is, like, you know, a native of this, like, clearly western town, is named Asano? I don't know. Yeah, like, I... I, I, as soon as D- Davu said, like, alternate universe where World War II went differently and everything's German and Japanese, I'm like, yeah, like, what if? What if all the films are connected? What if this is Grave of the Fireflies 2, but, like, uh, you know, Redux? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, I, I typed, where is Kiki's delivery service set into Google? It says, Miyazaki and his main staff visited Visby on the Swedish island of Gotland, and they also visited Stockholm, so I guess it's Swedish-based. Nice. Um, and I know it's based, it's based on a book from, uh, from, uh, Sweden. Look it up. Oh, the novel's actually Japanese, so. Huh, well, Nice. So I'm ready to just dive right into my metaphysical headcanon regarding the whole theme structure of the film. Are you ready? Yeah, go ahead. It begins when she's rapidly packing things up, and Gigi is naysaying the idea that they, they should be so soon. And she says, And if we put it off for a month, and I find some wonderful boyfriend, then what do we do? So that was yes. the line I didn't catch the first time I watched it. I was just sort of thinking of it as moving out of the house. I consider that line to be the keystone of the movie, but I feel the going by our notes, I feel the opposite way about it that you do. So I'm, I'll let you put it first. This is the kind of thing this podcast is for. So, what I saw there is that there's this gravitational pull of norminess, and Kiki recognizes that, and she's afraid of it. And I, I also like head canon that basically. She recognizes the sort of lost potential for uh, like academic or biopunk greatness that her mom had. And her mom is basically Nasuka in an alternate dimension where she settled down and became a mother. She has like the, like the same hair color and she does the same fucking thing, right? So I think, I don't know if that was deliberate or not, but I think the implication is that she was supposed like, like she was supposed to stop by this old town, this small town, for like one year to do her training back when she was 13. That's what the old lady said. Like, oh, I remember you, alternate universe Nausicaa. You showed up here when you were 13. But hold on, alternate universe Nausicaa is still here. So she must have found the perfect boyfriend and got herself a kid and stopped stopped advancing Ho- from then on out. Hopefully not when she was 13. Well, See, you know. that, that, that thing you just said, stopped advancing, that's where I disagree. Well, 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 stopped advancing specifically in the category of, like, she slowed down. She couldn't, like, she can't become, yeah. like, an eccentric fucking billionaire witch with a giant mansion But that's, that's the thing. That is not something to want. That's how I felt about, no, 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 like, yeah. what, what Kiki's whole misunderstanding yeah. is, she thinks... 
Like, it was really funny to me when I heard that line, because I was just like, what do you mean you might settle down with a nice boyfriend? Isn't that what you want? Like, oh, absolutely, yeah. Well, here's, yeah, but, but, if, but the thing is, if she does that, if she meets a boyfriend, then, you know, either she has to stay and can't go on this trip that she does legitimately want to go on, or, more likely, she'll have to leave the boyfriend behind to go do it, and she doesn't want to do that either. So it's like, I better, I better leave, I think the theory, the idea is like, I'm gonna, one of these days I'm gonna get a great boyfriend, I might as well leave now so that I'll yeah. get it, I'll get him in the place that I will be for the next year. Okay, Digi, I can see how the tone of my notes have misled uh, my thought on the theme. So, the... F- well, oh, mostly because of the sentence where you said, this movie is more stressful than, uh, than... Grave of the Fireflies. Um, Grave of the Fireflies. That's not because of that, but it's because of the fact that she's constantly fucking things up, right? That's yeah. what's really stressful about it. It's, it's kind of a cringe comp, but... It, is she... <laughs> <laughs> what does what does she fuck up? I mean, she drops the cat toy. Yeah, that was fucking stressful. So okay, uh, yeah, sure. So so the the way I see it, and and the uh, somewhat inspired by your whole like we have to find the code of the universe spirit journey you had this month, I was inspired to like culturally appropriate some terms from physics that I learned from Kurz Gazette videos and turn them into metaphysical <laughs> emotion concepts. I am going to I am going to police your use of these terms. Yes, uh, I have a I was not stringently. prepared for an actual physicist. So <laughs> we have every every piece of energy in the universe and all organisms try to find their vacuum state, which is their lowest point of entropy, right? What? Yeah, something like that. So What? I Yeah. Go go on. Uh, this is what Kurz Gazette said. Uh, not me. Don't don't blame Boy. me. So I see that as being something a human being does to settle down uh, when they get older. That's basically when you've grown up, and everyone's going to do it. And Kiki does want to do it, but it's sort of like like if you're at the top of a hill and a ball rolls down the hill, it's gonna like fall on a trench somewhere. That's when it's hit its vacuum state. That's when it's hit Here, its let's, lowest entropy. Let's put entropy. it this way. How about instead of vacuum state, we use the phrase sense of purpose. No, no, it, look, Devu, it, it seeks the it seeks its equilibrium state, which is the lowest point of energy. Okay, cool. Equilibrium state. Vacuum state sounds funnier though. And vacuum is also an alternative. Well, vacuum to room, state just so. sounds like the opposite of well, what well, you're describing. Well, vacuum state means that too. It's but lowest energy, not entropy. I like the idea of a vacuum. State because it sounds like a replacement for a broom, you know what I'm talking about? Anyway, so I had one more sentence to say for that fucking theme, which is that you basically, in your youth, you have to decide where to steer your vacuum. Like, you have to decide, like, where you're gonna settle down, because once you've settled, you're stuck, right? So Kiki well, you're not stuck. To, like you could, it gets you really could hard leave. to get out. It, 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 it's it's hard. just funny to think yeah, because yeah, yeah. It, assuming Kiki did stay in that town, there's two paths that w- she could have gone down. Either, yes, she meets a nice boy and settles down and is happy for the rest of her life, or she's unhappy because she doesn't want to live in this small town and her and her new boyfriend leave. Like, you know, I, I moved to Rochester to be with May. Rochester sucked. And we both hated it there. So, like, settling down with somebody didn't mean let's stay in the small town that sucks. We moved to fucking Boston, you know? Which is very much like the city in this movie. It's, like, very similarly uh, kind of organized, I would say. So, for, like, the moment that she shows up at this town, and then for, like, the next 30 minutes or so, you see the, the push and pull as to whether or not she wants to stay there. She doesn't seem to air any lines of dialogue regarding whether or not she wants to leave, but you see it in her face, and Gigi says it for her. Because... It seems like the perfect kind of town. She checks up, makes sure there's no witches, which apparently there can only be one witch per town or else there's going to be some trouble. That I didn't understand. It seems to imply that there is a, an incredibly small number of witches in the world. Right. But, like, oh, yeah, what definitely. Would be the pro- what would be the problem with multiple witches? Like, if one witch does fortune telling and one witch does a delivery service, what would be wrong with having more than one witch is in a town? Is it actually a rule or is it just that she is imposing on herself that she doesn't want to be... Doesn't want to have to know, She wants to be the witch. You know, you know what? That... That, that seems like something that Kiki would do. I, it came off to me as like some kind of archaic witch tradition, but I guess it's, it never actually mm, says that. My leading headcanon is it's similar to Mushishi, where the more magic users are in one spot, the more it's going to attract spirits. So if, say, seven or eight witches start like ganging up in one town, you're eventually going to have like an abundance of crows and then red skies and then I don't peeps. think this. I don't think this is a world where there are malevolent spirits to be attracted by witches. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe they're there, but they seem... They're so, probably pretty 
so, so she to checks out to make sure TV. there's no witches, right? And, and so she's like, cool, this looks like a good candidate. I just stumbled, like, ass backwards into this place. Who knows if we'll be able to find something better. But then she's, like, immediately gets in trouble with the police officer and feels like an idiot. And there is this scene where she's standing on a balcony, and it seems like she's considering leaving, and that, at that exact moment, she gets vacuumed, she gets sucked into the vacuum state with the whole pacifier delivered to the baby thing. Now she has a sense of purpose, and now she's getting kind of tied down, right? This is the push and pull of, like, never knowing whether or not the grass could be greener on the other side, but you don't want to, like, lose what you have in the in your current place, right? And she gets more and more sucked in, and who knows? If it hadn't been for, like, the fucking hippie girl and maybe the old lady, it may not have, and the boy, it may not have ultimately been worth staying in that place. She could have gotten sucked into a bad situation. Well, I mean, she could, if, I mean, if those things hadn't happened and things hadn't worked out for her the way she, it did, I mean, she could always, I mean, I guess it would kind of suck for, cause she's supposed to spend a year abroad and if she'd had to like relocate halfway through, then like, you know, she would have had to start all over again and she would have only have had half a year to build up her delivery service or whatever. And what's really interesting is that, uh, Gigi, the moment he gets laid, he gets com- sucked completely into his vacuum state and loses his like... Uh, what would you call it, like, homo sapien connection magic or whatever the fuck it is? No, 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 no. It, I, don't, I don't think that's what happened. I think that she couldn't understand him because she lost her magic. I don't think it had anything to do with him getting laid. I'm I'm kind of annoyed at, like, how many questions there are to ask about so many aspects of this film. Like, also, like, compa- cat sex compared is to... fucking horrifying. Just throwing that out there. Okay. <laughs> compared to, like, other Ghibli films... They have, like, a simple, easy-to-understand plot, and it's just really nice. But if you look at the detail, you'll understand even more. But mm. it feels like in this, the, like, the, like, the bare minimum is to watch it twice to understand anything that's happening, because it's so badly conveyed. Like, I don't, I don't, it's not, like, terribly conveyed. Personally, but, like, I felt that so way many about, like, every Ghibli up. movie, to be I honest. I felt, I mean, I don't feel like my experience of Kiki on the second time through was hugely different than my first Alright, well, I, I'm just considering that maybe I need to watch it again, because there's so many questions, and there's no real answers to them, and they're not really important questions, it's just, right. it just sort of feels annoying that there, there what, isn't what as question? much Ghibli let's, detail. Let's like, the, the ones you've let's been asking this whole time, like, maybe the cat did this, or maybe there's something else. One of the early notes I took was, uh, I don't remember if it's her mom, or so- someone says the phrase, it's not really important. And, like, definitely a part of the message of this movie is don't sweat the details don't sweat the small stuff because kiki is so fixated on the like oh i have to leave on the perfect night and it's like that is fucking irrelevant to what this is you know like to what this journey is like well i mean she needed good weather it seems like the weather is unpredictable here anyway like you can't even have a blimp anymore these days what the fuck yeah but like she it just seems like Kiki is so worried about the clothes that she's going to wear when she goes to the party the the thing like it's always just like how am i going to look how is it going to be it has to be just right but it doesn't because that's not what life's about it's never about doing it perfect it's about living it's about figuring out what your broad purpose is because you're like appearances that's all going to go away in the long run you know like those are the things you don't need to worry about because that shit is going to melt away once you're older and once you've settled down which kiki seems to know is going to happen but not why again like everything in her vision everything about how she wants things to go is just a misunderstanding of why she has to do the things she has to do why do you have to grow up why do you need to go to the big city why you know do you need to settle down i think talking about like the lore the mysterious lore i mean not, not, not all the ambiguity i find interesting not disconcerting but i think i kind of pick up on a bit of like a tension a push and pull regarding her feelings towards all the witch tradition because she loves to exploit the tradition that you leave when you're 13 because obviously she was jonesing to bust out as soon as she could and there's even a line of dialogue that's not it isn't in the disney dub but it's in the original dub and in the sub i have a download that can switch between all three so i checked uh that says most like it's mo- almost no one leaves at age 13 anymore because obviously times are changing people are becoming millennials right. and needs are happening probably <laughs> we're probably only a generation or two away from that people are becoming millennials <laughs> <laughs> it's all even in the 40s or whatever it was right. already happening <laughs> so what i what i think is interesting is that like you know, when you grew up with American media, when you grew up in that country, the standard rebellious youth is always just 
completely dismissive of all the old ways. You know, it's all written by people in LA who all came, who all escaped the fucking Christian traditions and they all have contempt for it. And it turns every fucking, you know, rambunctious kid into the same fucking idiot who just, like, just doesn't have anything to do with the old ways. But when you come, when there's writing about a kid from a more conservative, traditionalist country, there's a much more nuanced take on it, which is that she doesn't like dressing in all black, but she's like, well, I guess it's the tradition, so I guess it's what I'm supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. I and have like... written down Kiki's selective hearing, or mm -hmm. selective listening, because there's a part where when, when the crows warn them about like, hey, there's a wind current coming, and Gigi's like, hey, the crows are letting you know, and Kiki just blows it off, and it's like, it's really weird how, like, she clearly has respect for authority and her elders, and she has respect for people telling her what to do, but it's entirely up to her to ultimately make the decision on whether she agrees or not, and, like, you know, so she just totally ignores this advice about moving up, because she's just like, ah, it's crows, whatever, you know, like... And then she gets fucked over and loses a doll. And Gigi's like, I told you, the crows warned you. Like, why didn't you, like, you listen to other things I say. Why did you choose not to listen to this? But that's just fucking how kids are. Just straight up, that's just being a teenager, you know? I like the cat. The cat's fucking cute. Yeah, man. It oh, looks um, good. Speaking of the cat. So, wait, so there's more than one dub? Yeah, I don't know when the original dub Is was. Is the I'll Disney look it up. dub the one that had Phil Hartman as the cat? Uh,. If it's, it's whichever one, the cat kind of sounds like this. I, like, right. I, I recognize the voice. I'm almost certain it was Phil Hartman. I also yeah, it says, that... it says the Disney dub is Phil Hartman. Uh, the, okay, the, the kid with the dog. Maybe, am I fucking nuts, or was the kid with the dog voiced by Rainbow Dash? No, it was similar. I know I know the actor. I couldn't remember. I'm going to look it up right now. I'm looking it up, too. I'm INDB in this shit. So there was a, there was a dub by Streamline Pictures slash Tokuma, in 1990 and then disney in 1998 so yeah early, i think my original viewing was was sub so i thought i'll go for dub this time and kiki in the disney one is voiced by kirsten dunst uh and i just thought that that version was more professional but more bland so i went with the older one which was more goofy more cheesy but had a little bit more character I'm really not even sure which one I watched now, but like I do, I yeah. I did not like Kiki's performance in whichever one I watched. It probably like, I the thought Disney she sounded one, weirdly TVH. flat. Yes, yes, yeah. The Kirsten Dunst one. I mean, Kirsten Dunst is kind of weirdly flat. Is that That's the kind one of her thing. where she goes like, "When you're as, don't come crying. When you're as fat and round as a pancake, GG." Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh. What's funny line. is that that line. Yeah. So I checked. It is different in the sub versus dub. It actually is kind of funny. In in, uh, in Japanese, she says. Oh, I'm not gonna have any money. I'm gonna have to eat pancakes forever, forever, forever. That's what she says in Japanese, translated into English. In the dub, she says, I'm gonna eat pancakes every day and then become fat, 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 fat. fat. Yeah. Put a stupid yeah. bucket. Um, I, I thought it was strange that like when I think of pancakes, like people. People use pancake as a as a simile or, or whatever for flatness, for being like squished and flat and thin. Kiki uses it its roundness to imply maybe, fatness. Uh, like you will become as fat and round. Maybe as a pancakes pancake. in Japan are, are the same as bread in Japan, which is that they're much thicker and Bobby fluffier. Hill. Bobby Hill. It, it, <laughs> it was it's very the voice, strange. It's the voice of Bobby like, Hill. Dude, awesome. Wait, who? The ki the, the kid is the, that that kid is the, the the person who does his voice does the voice yeah. of Bobby Hill from King of the Hill. I cannot nice. find an IMDb listing for the. Disney I, I went version. on Wikipedia, but yeah, yeah, Wikipedia has it. Okay. Yeah, man. Fucking Bobby. Once upon a time, Hippocrit invented this term called non-diegetic and diegetic. <laughs> and in, in this movie, at the didn't, beginning, there's a scene didn't where I invent uh, those. The, the the opening theme of the film starts off non-diegetic, and then it switches over to the radio once the dialogue starts. That was cool. Uh, you know what I'm oh, talking about? Oh, uh, 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 oh, oh, yeah, I see, like, I see, It's just, yeah. like, playing the song, and then it switches oh, yeah. over to what it actually sounds like for her, which is on her radio. It's just a neat little transition. It's kind of funny, yeah. You know, yes, get I you like back that. into the movie. By the way, that, um, snotty, snooty, uh, fortune teller witch, I really am annoyed she is not a character in the film. She seems like your type. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I wrote down that... 
what's interesting about her, she's she's a perfect foil to Kiki in that she has the opposite extreme problem, where Kiki doesn't get the big picture at all, and she's sweating the details, and she's childish. This other girl's problem is that she's too self-serious and too unromantic, where she's just like, oh, I've got a job. I'm like, I'm a professional biatch, you know, but like... She's obviously quite prideful about it, and that's fine. Like, she's she's clearly doing well. It's not to say that she has a problem, just that, like, she is the total opposite extreme of Kiki. Like, I don't know. How do we know she's doing well? How do we know that she doesn't live in, like, a shack? And, and she, but, she, but she flies around in a fancy robe with a fancy necklace on and, like, tells other witches how well she's doing as, like, her escape. Maybe. But, like, I, I think it was implied that she is doing well because, for some reason, the uh, the, the windmill in her town has neon lights all over it. Yeah, like, that was Everyone weird. in in the town is doing so well that they can afford these fancy lights. <laughs> I don't yeah. know whether that was the I point, would, I would definitely but it was, say... It was very strange. One frustration of this movie is I kind of wanted it to, like, then have a 26-episode series documenting the whole year that she spends in the town. Because I really like the lore in this. I really like the lore in this. I really like where it could go. It really does feel like... I would it, absolutely watch I, I wonder sequel. if the novels go for a lot longer. I wouldn't know if well, there's a sequel I mean, or to, not. Not to, not to just skip straight to the ending or anything, but I'm going to do that. Uh... So I think – and this is how I finally understood what the hell the point of the ending was because it always bothered me that this movie is like so quaint and so slow and then it ends with like this big, audacious, cartoony, bombastic thing, right? Um, but like – so it, it bothered me that it was such a big, chaotic ending and then the movie's just kind of over. But like yeah. eventually what I realized is that the main thrust of Kiki's – depression is that she thinks she is not being accepted in this town right like she has it in her head that people here don't like her or that she doesn't have a place that her skill sets not really worth anything and like she gets a sense of purpose early on when they let her do the delivery service but then she's just bad at it and like there's a part where she says i used to enjoy flying until it became a job but it's not that she doesn't enjoy it because it's a job. She loved having the job at first. It's just when she was bad at it that she started hating it, you know? Mm, right. And so yeah. I, I think that it's just kind of this this sense of defeat that she keeps accruing throughout the movie, thinking, like, nobody likes me. I have ugly clothes. I'm an ugly girl. There's a part where she says to the artist, uh, she's like, I want you to huh. pose for my picture. And she says, I'm not very beautiful, though. And the, the artist just fucking laughs at her, which yeah. I love that moment. Because I'm like, yeah, of course, you're a fucking Ghibli girl. Of course, you're beautiful, I love you that idiot. she says, like, know? I need to finish the painting. Could you be my model? Because you could be a part-time model, but you'd probably still have to keep your normal job as a baker and delivery service woman. Uh, I don't think that was in the, uh, the Disney it. dub. I don't remember that line at all. That's yeah. interesting. That's it's interesting. A, it's a reference. A oh, reference that I uh, got, I got that reference. You got a good job, you did it, you did the graphic, yeah. So. Well, I don't get it. Yeah, I don't um. get it still. <laughs> Anyways, but yeah, so she says, you know, she's saying that she, she, she basically is just disappointed with herself, and she keeps getting more and more depressed because she keeps fucking up and failing, but... What The reason that it had to be such a big event and the keystone moment in the ending is when she gets on the broom and literally everyone in the streets is looking at her. This is like the moment that could either be the most othering imaginable if she fails or she's about to be a hero in the eyes of literally everyone in town. So like the reason it has to be such a big deal is that like, l yeah, literally Everybody knows who she is now. Everyone thinks she's cool. Everyone thinks she's a badass. And now she can feel at home in this place. And that's that, why it kind that, of works as an ending. That, no, did you? That I think that sucks so much. Uh, you I know think what? I don't awful. disagree because I think it is. I think it's too simplistic of a way to yeah. just resolve yeah. the entire conflict like, in one film. Like we're, we're 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 watching this girl. This you know, sure she can fly, but like for the most part, she's a normal girl like like any of us. Or yeah, I mean, a normal person like any of us, right? She moves to this town and she's. Start, and she's starting a business, and she's dealing with normal problems, and she's got fucking self-esteem issues, she's got acceptance issues, she doesn't feel like she belongs in her community. And we're like, oh, how, will she, how is she going to resolve this? Like, what lesson is she going to learn? Like, what's going to change in her to bring about, like, you know, a resolution of this internal conflict? And the end, and the way that the movie resolves it, is a fucking disaster happens, and she saves someone, and is on the news, and is a hero. Right. Fuck that. Did you, I do Garbage. remember you saying that Garbage this, ending. Compared to the other... Miyazaki movies, this one feels like it's written a lot more mechanically. It has more of that, like, Hollywood structure. You know structure. what it is? It feels like more of an adaptation. 
Like, right. all because a lot of his movies are adaptations of novels. This one feels like a point for point. Like, here's what happened at this part of the book. Like, kind of like a Harry Potter movie where you you kind of feel like you're just going through. Like, okay, well, every every book is one year, so here's the key moments we have to do through every year, you know. And um, and with this movie, yeah, it, it feels – the pacing all around is just kind of off. Like, yeah. some of the scenes in the beginning go on way too long. I thought, like, her getting introduced to the town took forever. I, I was annoyed that, that like, um, I felt like it was, it was kind of depressing uh, through a lot of the mo- – uh, th- uh, through a lot of the movie because – there is no mentor for her until like right at the very end with the painting lady, and she has, she has to go like the baker, a lady's just sort of there. She doesn't really help her too much. She just sort of is putting a roof over her head, but she doesn't have anyone to go to to talk about anything until like right at the end of the movie. That was and what then bothered suddenly... me. Sorry, the yeah. last time I saw the movie, like I kind of had because historically I had liked this movie, but last time I watched it, I was like, man, this movie's just kind of depressing. Like it's just watching Kiki fail over and over again. Wait, wait, I don't, I don't. Wait, when does she fail? Other than when she doesn't okay, deliver. Okay, when she the first cat. comes to town, she fails to communicate with everybody. Uh, yeah. She every time she talks to Tombo, it falls through in some way. Um, every well, time she, she does like a delivery, Tombo. it falls through. She doesn't, she doesn't want way. it. She doesn't want it to go. I no, don't she that. does like family. Tombo from the very start, though. Because yeah. when he invites her to go to the party, the second time they ever interact, she's like fucking like super through the roof with excitement to go to the party. Like she, I think she really appreciates Tombo because he's paying attention to her. It's just that she wants it on her terms. Like right. she doesn't like she doesn't like what he stands for because he's not the kind of guy who she thinks she wants or not the kind of person she thinks she wants but like when she sees his flying machine then she realizes oh okay this guy's like passionate he's building something like he actually is a human you know that was when to me was, was i was she definitely like maybe maybe she was interested in him on some level like when he invited her to the party but when she she shows her the flying machine that's when she definitely warms up to him is like okay maybe i maybe i do like this I, guy I guess now. your rea- one's reaction to this entire movie will hinge on the fact that you're, you're really supposed to relate to Kiki in every scene, and so it just so happens that me and Digi like, are pretty close compared to probably the vast majority of people, I would say. So, like, I feel like I'm able to get every scene. It's not even that I completely connected, because, again, I've seen this movie four times, and this is the only time I fully felt like I appreciated what, what everything was about, but it was less from relating to Kiki and more from relating to the adults around her. That, like, and, and granted... In the end, I can look at Kiki's attitude and I can say, yeah, everything she does in this movie is kind of how I was as a teenager, except that I think I understood a lot more of the point. Like, I don't think I was as foolish as she is, but, like, it's through listening to how other characters talk to her that I started to get what the movie was trying to tell me about Kiki. That, like, it's not so much that... I relate to her specific, like, I've never really been somebody who cares about how I look in public, like, or, or not that I don't care, um, I other myself the same way that she does in my mind, but in Kiki's case, she can project that onto, it's because I have to wear this, these uncool clothes, and, like, that's why, that's the only reason, and for me, it was always like, no, I just hate other people, and, like, I think the fact that they would look down on me for wearing what I wear makes them pieces of shit. Whereas for her, it's like, I am a piece of shit because I don't have good clothes. But, like, the reality for both of us, and this is where I did connect, is that that was never the case. People like her outfit. And one of my favorite lines is when she comes to Asano and she's like, I'm not going to have time to, like, I don't have any clothes. Like, what do I do? How do I go to the party? And Asano's like, just wear what you're wearing. It makes you look cool and mysterious. And it's like, yeah, "Yeah, of course. Like, when you think about it, of course. Of course she's wearing the best possible outfit. Because as long as you're confident, you can rock anything. Like, you know, we, me, we're all big peacockers here, like uh, cluster <laughs> punk motherfuckers. Me and Ben especially. Like, you know, we'll walk into a party and people aren't going to say, wow, you're a piece of shit for wearing that weird shirt. They're going to say, what's with the weird shirt? And if you go, yeah... I picked it up for three dollars. I'm a badass. They'll be like, "Well, yeah. shit," you know. You, 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 if you roll with it, it's fine. 
Exactly. Uh, any, like basically anything is fine if you just roll with. This. I was I was um a little confused about how they brought up like the red uh, shiny shoes in the in the shop window. That never came up again, did it? And yeah, and, and a lot of things like that never come up again. I don't even remember those. Yeah, Tavu is right that this feels like there's a lot of setup for things that would happen in further episodes of the show. I yeah. I have a complaint. I have another complaint about the ending. Which is that not only is does it thema- is it thematically terrible, uh, it's tedious and obnoxious um, in the way that it does it. Okay, how many times in a row can Kiki lose control of her broom only to miraculously suddenly fly again right before she hits the ground? I think that happens like three times in a row. Ben, I got to say, uh, it's I, just such a I, coincidence. I have to say, I feel pretty deflated in my optimism regarding you liking the movie more than us. You're complaining the most. Yeah, well, because the movie sucks shit and it's garbage. No, it, it, it's, I mean, I like I like everything. I love the movie up until the ending, and I think the ending is a big I one. I mean, I, I guess I can say that the ending is meant to be like a microcosm of the movie up to that point, that she keeps falling and getting back up and falling and getting uh, back up. And yeah, like, yeah, but yeah sure. it's, it's not the and then best And then watching her, watching her on the shitty broom, like... Two feet away from Tombo, reaching out her hand like, uh, oh, is he gonna? Is she gonna get him? Is she? Oh no, she fell. Oh, oh, this time. Oh, is she gonna grab? Him? Is she gonna? Gra- oh no, she fell. And then you know, and then he falls, and she catches him in midair, and it's like Jesus fucking Christ. I would say that this movie has a problem with a lack of variety in general. Like mm-hmm. they could have, like, but with that ending scene, but also with the whole movie, it's like we watch her like have two different times where it's just like the delivery went horribly wrong, and both scenes feel exactly the same. It's like, she's st- like, you know, the, the scene where she drops the cat and the scene where she gets rained on, like, it both feels like the same thing. And the ending, she keeps hitting buildings and everything. Or even at the start when she flies over the town, it's just like, here's a bunch of shots of the town. Like, there's not enough here and then there, you know? I remember in your previous review of the movie late last year, you, you, you addressed the whole rep- uh, repetitiveness complaint, which I think, going back as far as I've watched your videos, uh, uh, you often bring up the repetitiveness complaint, but I think it's often more just a case of the stuff that is happening is less fun. That's what I would describe Kiki as, the movie. Like, the stuff that's happening is not as fun as, like, Totoro or Ponyo or Spirit of the Way, and so it feels more repetitive. I mean, they, they, I feel like they're, they're banking on the fact that you, 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 you love, like, the idea of flying on a broomstick, and you can be like, oh, imagine if I was up on that broomstick. And that's like, because it could have been, it could have been a girl on a bike doing all of this. I feel like my fucking mm. point there is going to be trampled on if I don't present my evidence, which is that Totoro, if you don't at all jive with the idea of girls hanging out in the woods with floating cats, it would feel repetitive. Like the three different scenes they spin together, if you don't like it, will feel like the same scene every time. If you're well, really into I, it. I mean, like, if you watch Totoro, though, like, the, the whole cat bus scene. That is, like, such a distinct scene that feels like nothing in any other movie. And there's nothing in this movie that has that level of, like, just creativity and uniqueness and inventiveness. It's, like, the problems that she faces, like, she gets attacked by...